started? Sure. I know the first topic of the work session agenda is a talk about the, I'm going to call it the SR3006 or West Water Street, and the bridge there in front of the My Buzz Cafe is slated to be repaired in 2024. And as part of the PennDOT Connects program, PennDOT officials have come in and met with me probably was, I would say, probably uh, January, February of this year to, to go over the project, talk about uh, any businesses that would be impacted, any projects in the area that would be impacted potentially, and the idea is to try to work through any known problems prior to the project. Obviously, it's going to be a disruption in traffic flow and patterns and could be you know, it could be a hindrance to small businesses uh, trying to make a living. So we talked about the project and from that meeting back in February, we t I thought of and I presented to council about not repairing the bridge and actually filling in that bridge underneath the bridge. The bridge is over a man-made mill race that has been there for 100 years or so. And uh, you know, part of the mill race is covered up in Talleyrand Park, down at the other end where the mill race, uh, you know, pretty much terminates around the Gamble Mill. The Gamble Mill new owners uh, terminated the mill race water from ever going underneath the building. So right now it's bypassed around the Gamble Mill and goes underneath West Lamb Street in daylights and goes back out and eventually meets Spring Creek. So uh, we, I thought about instead of, and I asked the at the time the PennDOT officials what was the estimated cost of the project. The reply was about 1.3 to 1.4 million dollars to repair this existing bridge. Again, it's right in, you wouldn't notice it driving over it, but it's right in front of my Buzz Cafe crosses West High Street over to Talleyrand Park, and the brick walkway in Talleyrand Park is part of the mill race. And years ago, that was bricked over, you know, for aesthetic purposes. And I, you know, the, the one going back to the 1.3 to 1.4 million dollar estimate. I thought, you know, you're obviously going to need some money to do either filling in the, underneath the bridge or maybe putting in some a concrete culvert or something if, if there was some desire to have some amount of water go through there. I think that's still feasible, but it would not be a bridge. It would be more or less, you know, something you can drive over, but the bridge would be gone. And you take the <clears throat> excess funding, the million dollars, and move it over to the area of Mill Street, Phoenix Avenue, Water Street, you know, Willbank Street area. Going back in time about a year ago or a year and a half ago, we wrote a letter, the borough wrote a letter to the Center County MPO asking for a joint project where we would try to, you know, get some alignment, get a, either a traffic light at Phoenix Avenue or Mill Street realigned with Phoenix Avenue or some type of reconfiguration that would be better suited for the volume of traffic coming in and out of town, people coming in and out of the match factory. It's been a problem since the match factory has been redeveloped. Uh, back starting in the early 2000s when that development started to take shape. Uh, so, you know, in my view, there's a, there's a lot of priorities and never enough resources. And of course, we're talking money. So if we were to show the MPO or PennDOT we're behind moving funds, maybe a million dollars over to the project, somewhere over there, they the, the MPO and, of course, Center Region Planning Agency, Tom Zilla is the staff for the MPO and, and you know, knows the mechanics better than anybody about moving funds and how to start that process. But 
he is here he, he's in our audience he, he's welcome you know, I, I invited him to uh, chime in at any time uh, he can describe the process and what it's going to take to get on the radar so to speak there's a planning process getting money on the transportation improvement plan there's some you know some maneuvering with spring township where we work together uh, tom has provided a kind of a step-by-step -step guide on how this might take shape forming a, a working committee a working group <clears throat> with spring township to you know get some momentum behind this project get it on the radar for the mpo and eventually get funding but you know as i noted at their last meeting and maybe tom can speak to this how valuable it is if the local municipality puts in some money or puts in some effort to show that they're serious this money from moving it from one to one pot to another might help put this on the radar so and so that's kind of to get us started in discussions i'm happy to try to expand i'm try, happy to try to explain better but in a nutshell that's my plan try to move funds from West High Street and not not repair the bridge but do something more permanent move them over to a more critical area you know West or sorry South Water and Mill Street and Phoenix Avenue I, I can try to answer questions or maybe Tom wants to chime in and say uh, what he tried to describe in those handouts that we had I had included in the packet well, are you, are you looking where Mill Street comes out now? Are you looking, trying to align those, <clears throat> you're trying to align that intersection there. Would, would, would that take the place of extended Spring Street going out where it meets the mill out there? Would, would the new intersection, if we put a new intersection there, that would relieve all that traffic on coming into town that way? Well, there, there, the way, I think, we, uh, first of all, PennDOT was here, I think at Miller was it two years ago maybe? Oh, yeah, okay all right somewhere around there you know uh, quite a while ago a year and a half or so ago Tom Zarat Tom Zilla were here and talked about some potential options so I don't think we've identified which option there one option included a bridge from the existing Mill Street Axeman Road over the railroad tracks that uh, go along Mill Street and then make a turn and come out and meet Phoenix Avenue. Yeah, I forgot about the railroad tracks. There, yeah, there, there are other possibilities, buddy, to realign Mill Street or maybe even, uh, you know, I know EMS wants to move out. Yeah. If we were to realign Phoenix Avenue with Mill Street, you'd have everything lined up. You'd have the railroad track, the Mill Street, Phoenix Avenue lined up. I think there's potential there, especially now that we own this, the Snappy property. Some of these things were not in, in play even a couple years ago, but now they are. Uh, so are you saying that you would move Phoenix Avenue to the Tally Rack Park side through, uh, through next to the parking lot that goes into the uh, Talleyrand Park extension. I'm saying that's an option to look at. Which then causes another issue yes. with the bank <laughs> show. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Very true. So there are options and you, you have to, you know, figure out what's the most critical, what makes the most sense long term. You know, once this is done, the, let me let me just rephrase some of the problems. Because some of you are new, some of you have been here a while, but this problem, like I said, goes back to early 2000 when the match factory was purchased by the American Philatelic Society. We, the borough, started to develop that side of the park around that time frame. You know, first of all, the idea was Phoenix Avenue needs a traffic light, you know, to get people in and out, you know how busy it is during the rush hours that people can't get out a reasonable amount of time or it's not safe trying to get out that was one issue well if you put a traffic light in then you have a major safety issue with the potential of people being stopped on the railroad tracks as they back up or setting for the light to turn and a potential for a train to come so you know everybody 
anybody in the industry said you can't have that. You can't have people stopped at a traffic light 100 yards ahead of you and have them setting on the tracks, you know, so that was a no-go. So that has complicated the issue. I can tell you, I don't know how many times we've had, we even had a study done probably around uh, 2004 or five with Trans Associates, really no solid answer, you know, no, no solid direction because of the, you can't move the tracks, you can't move like stony batter, that's another complicated issue. Uh, you know, the bridge that crosses over Logan Branch is actually too narrow. It needs to be widened if you're gonna have an intersection and you want a turning lane. The bridge over Logan Branch needs to be widened if that's where it goes. If, that, if the traffic light goes at Phoenix, you have to widen the Logan Street Bridge. So, you know, all of a sudden you're talking millions. You know, a bridge over the tracks and over, over Mill Street or from the Mill Street Axeman Road area over to meet Phoenix is millions. Logan Street, uh, Logan Branch Bridge is millions. So I, that's why I say you got to look out, outside the box or something different than we, we have been looking. What I, what I would say is in January, the borough purchased the Snappy property. That's probably the most recent turn of events. And of course, you know, six months before that or so, we wrote a letter saying we would like to see more, you know, interaction with Spring Township, connecting uh, our pathways to their pathways to the serial complex, more economic development for both of us. Uh, so, you know, that the, all these things, you know, make you start to think there's there's maybe higher priorities and then using $1.3 million to fill in or repair a bridge that really nobody even realizes is there. Uh, that, that's kind of, a, you know, where we're at today. So my question is, I, I personally like having the water on both sides of the waterfront development property. Uh, is there some way and how much might, what would it be the difference in cost if we were to do the, the culvert pipe that you were talking about versus just make, make it a, a, a dry well? I don't know the answer to that. I would be <coughs> amenable to that. I'm less amenable to uh, completely getting rid of the water. Tom, do you, I mean, in a, in a bridge repair project, would it be, could we meet with PennDOT Connects officials or staff and say, you know, we would like a modified project and would like to move funds over to another project. Would they go for something like that? I mean. I need to go out to the. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. You know, I, I think, uh, and for those that don't know me, my name is Tom Zillow. As Ralph said, I work up at the Center Region Planning Agency, but the program that I work in is countywide for the uh, countywide Center County Metropolitan Planning Organization. Uh, that's a group of uh, st state, county, and local officials who have responsibility for uh, roadway, bridge, and public transportation planning and funding uh, because we are an urbanized or metropolitan uh, county here in Center County. So it's kind of a weird arrangement, but um, you know, I, I basically I'm doing countywide transportation planning uh, out of that agency. So, uh, you know, the theory, Ralph, is, is sound. I mean, the MPO and PennDOT do shift funds around, and I think the kind of the good faith effort, so to speak, would be uh, useful. But there are a lot of complications. Uh, the type of funding that's involved, the year in which it's programmed, whether it's eligible for different uses, all come into play into whether you can shift uh, funds around for something like this. So. Uh, I don't know the answer to uh, your question about what the difference in cost would be with the different scope. That is something that could be discussed with PennDOT to see if they'd be amenable to that. Over the long term, the ability of PennDOT to divest itself of infrastructure that, uh, I'll say for lack of a better term, isn't really needed 
So if you really don't need a bridge in a location and it can be filled in and, and something else accommodate that, helps them and us uh, over time in terms of the public's uh, need to uh, put tax dollars into something like that. So again, the theory of all those things is solid. Uh, I'm going to come in and I'll, I'll give you my two cents and, and kind of my recommendation tonight uh, for council to think about. Uh, and I'm going to cut to the chase with that. I'm happy to answer questions as, as directed uh, by your chair and, and by Ralph. Uh, I, I actually think that these two projects should be decoupled and approached independently. And the reason for that is the, the Route 150 Phoenix intersection, as Ralph indicated, we, we call it at a staff level the perfect storm. It pretty much has all the bad things, oh, I shouldn't say all the all the complicated things you can <laughs> picture in a project. Uh, you know, we've got historic resources, natural resources with the stream, we've got the bridge, uh, which is borderline in terms of its condition, so at some point in the near future it's going to have to be uh, repaired or replaced. Uh, the railroad tracks close to the intersection, development pressures, we got it all. Uh, so two municipalities. Uh, I think it's going to be complicated to put forward, but I, I love the project. I, I'm, I've given Ralph, as he indicated, just some, some of my thoughts about how the two municipalities may work together to try to push it. But I can guarantee you this, it is going to take a community push to get this project moving again and forward to whatever it ends up being in terms of alternatives. Uh, a feasibility study was done, PennDOT was here, uh, and I was here with them January of 20 to talk about that. We went to Spring Township just this year because we got pushed back here by COVID, but there's no more funding program for the project to continue to the next phase. So to get it on our next program, which we're going to start working on in the next month or two uh, for adoption a year from now in, in June, is, it's going to need a community push from the two municipalities. There's just no doubt in my mind that, that because of the complications, the cost, it's going to need that push. And that push is going to have to continue over time. And it's going to have to have successors uh, to the leaders and champions who might be in place today to push it, because we're, we're talking probably about a five to ten year process before a project gets done there, uh, if all the things come together. So, uh, so that's one side of my recommendation. Just because it's so complicated, I really think efforts should focus on that. Now, the mill race and that bridge has a lot of positives also. Uh, the good faith effort is going to help the borough and other municipalities nearby gain support from PennDOT for other projects. If we don't have to invest the amount of resources in that project, uh, then those resources can go elsewhere. And I know you have other concerns. I, I know uh, that there's uh, discussions about uh, potential changes at the diamond. Uh, personally, I think when the waterfront development starts to come in, there's going to be needs in that area related to transportation that are going to require some resources. So if you don't have to put that amount of money into a full bridge replacement or rehab, this was a rehab, uh, and can do something else, then that does free up other resources and by the uh, Council's initiative, municipalities' initiative to do that, that does build, build goodwill with uh, PennDOT and the MPO. So, so I think there's some positives there. I'm worried about them being linked together. Uh, I've seen other projects that have been linked together that are complicated, and if one starts to go south for whatever reason, it drags the other one with it. And that's what my concern would be here. Uh, there's also some practical considerations with the cost. So the, the estimate that Ralph mentioned uh, over a million dollars is actually on our program for two bridge projects. There are two bridge projects involved in that particular bridge rehab, and that's not unusual. Sometimes we might have six rehab projects, six rehab locations under one bridge project. Sometimes it's only one. Uh, it's just the way PennDOT uh, develops these projects. So this particular one had two projects, one over on Old Route 220 uh, and, and the uh, one here on uh, uh, over the mill race. So. I don't know what the split between them is, so we're probably not talking the full million, it's, it's something less. And then the timing of these projects. So the source of funds and when they're supposed to go in 24 may not match up with uh, 150 in Phoenix because we have to get that preliminary engineering phase, this next phase of the Route 150 uh, Phoenix intersection underway to know what is feasible. Uh, truly feasible and, and that can be cleared environmentally from the uh, alternatives that they put forth in the feasibility study. What's it going to cost? What's the time frame? And how long does it take to develop with all those 
uh, features that have to be addressed. So I just don't know if the match can, can really work. Uh, also now, uh, I did some research today uh, in preparation for tonight, and it looks like PennDOT's going to flip one of the bridge rehab projects, and this one would actually move to 2025 rather than 2024. Uh, and there's some reasons for that. It has to do with which, when they inspect bridges on a couple year basis, if they identify another bridge that has more critical issues, they'll say, hey, we really need to do this one before that. And that is the case uh, with this particular project. So it's going to move to 2025. It's a different pot of funds. Uh, it's a different amount. So I don't think the swap could be you know, kind of a one for one. So uh, that's kind of my thought in terms of making a recommendation. I, I think it's definitely worthwhile to pursue these, but my recommendation is kind of pursue them independently. Clearly, both would need a lot of support, in this case from council, and in the case of 150 intersection from Spring Township as well. For you to make a decision as recommended or suggested by staff uh, to do changes to the mill race is a big decision for you policy-wise. I mean, that, that's not something, in, in my email to Ralph, I said, you know, it's really, uh, really in council's lap to make those decisions. And I, and I know that that's what PennDOT's going to say. You know, they're not going to move and give you direction or anything. They're going to want that to come from you. And then they would be willing to, I think, build a partnership to do something like that. So, you know, that, I know that that involves some big decisions uh, on, on council's part, uh, on the borough's part. So that's kind of why my recommendation is, is to keep them separate, but definitely pursue them both, uh, but independent. Mentioned uh, once the uh, waterfront uh, development starts, that there will have to be some. Uh, you anticipate some changes. Anticipate. Anticipate. Uh, what what might that be, or do you not want to uh, mention that? At this no, time? I've, I've, I've commented to, to both Don and, and Ralph on, on occasion that um, typically what happens is traffic impact studies are done for development of that site then that identifies mitigation measures for impacts caused by additional traffic. Uh, none of that has been done to the best of my knowledge. I don't think they've done a TIS. So I, that's why I'm saying I anticipate, because I really don't know uh, what might happen. But that could involve changes to the signal timing. That could involve, well, we're in a really constrained environment. So you know, making lane changes or capacity improvements is, is tough to do in, in this environment. But, uh, I would guess that signal timing changes and some stuff like that might might come out of a TIS that, uh, that has to be done at that time. Uh, and the tricky thing is, is you've got some state roads that border on that waterfront site. So Pendon is going to be involved in that, so the decisions are not going to be entirely in council's hands uh, for those types of measures. Uh, and you know, Pendon is bound by a certain set of regulations. And, Many times we're, we're involved in traffic impact studies with them. There are challenges uh, from both sides. I mean, I don't, I'm not saying that one way or the other. It's just a challenge for the developer. It's a challenge for the municipality. It's a challenge for PENDA, because ultimately they're responsible for what goes on on, on the roads that they own. So I, I anticipate some of those types of things. I'm hoping it wouldn't involve major changes, because again, we're in a very constrained physical environment there. So the waterfront development group is planning on reopening Dunlap, which we closed down, what, eight years ago? A few, a few years ago. A yeah. few years ago. How might that affect the mill race issue? Because that's right before you get to that bridge. Yeah, I, I, I really can't say, Joanne. I mean, I, I just, I, I don't have a good enough feel from a traffic engineering perspective, and I don't want to speculate okay. uh, to you and create other issues. By you know, giving you guesses, you know. okay. about as far as I'm willing to go is to say that I anticipate that there will be some, you know, issues and potential changes. But uh, I, I, I just don't want to speculate. I know that the project, um, the last time that I was uh, heard anything about the waterfront was probably like a couple of years ago. Yeah. I think when they made the presentation at the chamber lunch, yeah. which is the last information that I had, and I believe it's been downscoped since. So. But again, I, I wouldn't. Uh, I don't want to get you sidetracked with that particular issue. That that was not my intent. I just, I think it's, just from my perspective, better to approach these independently. But I do think both of them are worthwhile. They have some really good positives for for how Ralph uh, discussed this. So, so let me ask you another question. You said that you would recommend us not 
putting these two projects together. When talking to PennDOT, how would you recommend us talking about doing the Mill Race project and then separately the Phoenix Avenue project so that we had the best bang for what limited bucks we have? I think the mill race one is exactly what Ralph said. They have this connects process, as we call it, where they discuss with municipalities projects well in advance of when they're going to advance. So I think the best thing there would be for Ralph to, to contact them and say, we want to revisit the connects process for this uh, mill race project and talk about what the implications might be. You know, would there be cost benefits? Uh, how would they go about determining that? Uh, but again, I, I know what they're going to say. They're going to turn around and say right back to Ralph and to us, or usually the MPO staff's part of it. What has council said? Are they making this commitment? Has it been decided? So, you know, it's a little bit of back and forth. On that. So I, I do think council will have to give some hard thought to uh, being able to give Ralph direction uh, on, you know, what, what are we going to say back when Pendo asks about that question. For instance, today they asked, I, I, when I was emailing them about the information, they said, well, have, have they considered the historical implications for this? And I said, we're, we're nowhere near any of that. This is just the initial stages of, uh, of uh, council's discussions. So hopefully I didn't cover the mic. Did I cover the mic with my file? Uh, so I, I think that's the easy one. The 150 Phoenix intersection, that's, that's again, a little bit more challenging because it involves two municipalities, which I think need to work together to really achieve the best community input. And it's going to be a long-term effort that involves a lot of work. So I, again, I've given Ralph some of my thoughts. I don't know if Ralph shared them with council, but uh, again, they're my thoughts. It, it really is the community that needs to kind of get behind this. So there, there certainly could be other approaches uh, that council members, other members of the community staff have to make that happen. But the starting point, though, I think, is the MPO needs to receive a letter before we send our agenda packets out for our September meetings, so around the beginning of September, end of August, beginning of September, indicating that both municipalities are interested in funding the next phase of the intersection project. Because in September, I'll be presenting to the MPO what our funding allocation is for the new program, which is going to be exactly the same as our current program, unfortunately. Well, it's not going down, it's not going up. Uh, but it's pretty limited. Uh, it's 43 million over four years, which sounds like a lot, but to give you an idea, the Atherton Street project, the next one to go, uh, that's going to be constructed next year, is going to be over 17 million. So one project is over 30, 33 percent of our program, one project. Uh, and Ralph talked about the millions involved in some of the others. So Phoenix, 150 in Phoenix, I, I don't really know how much it's going to cost, but it's going to be millions. So uh, it would be great to have that in the packet so that when I present recommendations and what the staff priorities are going into the update, and this one was going to be uh, one of them, that it's not just me as a staff person, it's the two municipalities affected. So that's the first step on the other one. So for that project to make it e an easier job for you, would it be helpful if we passed a motion uh, this evening to talk to Spring Township to make a joint letter of commitment for the Phoenix Avenue to have to you by the middle of August. I don't know the process, Ralph. I don't sure. want to step on toes. So, if you, you think to, you need a letter, ideally before the beginning of September? Is that that's that, what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and it would be great if it came from both municipalities. I mean, jointly would be awesome, but I, you know, I know that that can be a challenge. So. But even if both municipalities weighed in, that would be great. I, I don't know how your process works, though, so that's why I'm a little reticent here to comment. But yes, it would be great to get a letter by uh, by the beginning of September. Okay. Would it be as important if Nittany Valley Planning supported that, too? Well, I know it's very important to spring in Belfont Borough, but would it be helpful also for uh, that? Along the path, yes, because ultimately it's used by a lot of folks who live in the Nittany Valley who may not be in Belfont Borough or Spring Township. You, know, you have Benner Township users and others who are even more distant. So, uh, yes, ultimately that would help. And would you like that before September? That support, if it would be possible. 
if you can do it, that's great. If not, if, you know, we're, this this tip development process lasts for her about about a year from now. We're going to start here in the next month, uh, and the steps. And I did have them here, so I'll just run through them very quickly. Uh, a preliminary draft will be done for the MPO to look at, usually around November, December, uh, and then a final draft is done in February. And that's when the MPO typically gives us the authorization to advertise the final draft for a formal comment period. And then that formal comment period usually occurs in April and May, and then the MPO will take action in June. Uh, the state takes action usually in August. Uh, the feds will approve it in September, and it, it will take effect on October 1 of next year, October 1 of 22. So that's kind of how the process works. And, and Ralph is very familiar with it. Uh, Council has submitted letters to us for both the TIP and the long-range plan updates as part of the formal comment period. But in this case, I'd really like having something going in because, you know, funding is short and it makes it a lot tougher for me to uh, negotiate with PennDOT, frankly, as we're looking at projects. If I already have documentation that the community is interested in, in pushing for a project, then it's not just me as staff, it's you as elected officials. If I heard you correctly, the, the mill rate should get back up one year? Okay. Yes, that's correct. And I recall having a discussion with PennDOT earlier this year, uh, but when I was looking in the database today and I saw it, I didn't have that recollection for a while because I'm getting old and I forget. Uh, so by the end of the day, when I had gone back and forth with folks on a couple emails, I definitely recall having a conversation earlier this year. Uh, there's another bridge in a, in a portion of the county that had some immediate concerns, so they wanted to shift uh, shift this one out a little bit. Uh, but with with that said, Randy, I have no doubt that you know they, they've known that these discussions have been back and forth with, at the staff level too. Uh, and I'm sure at the time we probably said, well, you know, if there's a possibility that this project may take a different scope and a different turn, then it's probably not a, it's not a bad idea or it's okay to, to push it back uh, a year. So. <clears throat> and one thing, the last thing I'll leave you with about this preliminary engineering phase of the intersection project, why it's so important. When you get to the end of that phase, that's when you get environmental clearance from the federal and state agencies that are involved, because in all likelihood there will be uh, some federal funds uh, involved in the project. Uh, and that is really critical. So uh, we've only had one project that really got stopped because it couldn't get environmental clearance uh, in recent years, but it still leaves you know a sting to me. And, and that we were trying to do a park and ride lot over in uh, Potter Township at Old Fort. And we just didn't walk through the steps in a way that uh, the f uh, federal agencies could give us environmental approval. And we didn't get it. And uh, it always bugs me, you know. And uh, we, we thought we were doing the right thing at the time with how we approached it. We were trying to negotiate with a uh, property owner who was willing to give us the land or to sell the land for uh, the project. So we didn't look at alternative sites. In order to get environmental clearance, you got to look at alternative sites for that particular project. But I'm worried about that same type of thing here because I know there's, I've, I've had many questions over time about <clears throat> why can't we acquire this property that's going up for sale and have it ready? Well, you, if you do that, you're, you're really, it's, it's not a good thing in that process because if you haven't followed the process properly, you risk getting that environmental clearance for, for the funding to be there for construction. So that's why getting this preliminary engineering phase on the tip and done and getting environmental clearance is that is the critical step. So first part of that's get it on the program. The first part of that's getting some community support. Let me ask you one other question going back to the bell race. It, it, do we need, if we were to change the, re, the rehab of the bridge to something else, would we have to have this environmental impact study done as well? There will be environmental clearance. Probably wouldn't be a full environmental impact uh, study. Uh, but there are different levels of environmental clearance. Uh, typically, a project like that is in the lowest level, which is called a categorical exclusion. Uh, the middle level is an environmental assessment. So just to give you a, a, an idea, the Potter's Mills Gap project, the major highway project that went up through the gap, ended up being an environmental assessment. 
Uh, now, usually a project that big will go up to the in environmental impact statement stage, but not many places you could put a project up through the gap up there, so it ended up falling in the middle level. But your bridge replacements, your bridge rehabs, they will typically fall in the lowest level categorical exclusions. There are levels within that, uh, but there will have to be that type of clearance. Thank you. Any other questions from anyone? Okay. Thanks for the opportunity to be here tonight. I'll continue to work with Ralph at his direction, and uh, we'll see what we can get accomplished here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next up is Luana from Pata. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having us out. Um, so um, I had sent some information in advance because uh, I recognize most faces here, but uh, I thought that there might be a couple of new people since we did the uh, kickoff of Catago um, just, what, about six weeks before the pandemic hit. Uh, so I wanted to uh, send out a little bit of information um, just so there'd be a general understanding of the Catago pro um, program. Um, I also have some folks from staff here so that uh, when you ask some really deep questions that I don't have all the answers for, I have the pros here. So um, I thought what I would do just really quickly, uh, just to layer on top of the information that, we, that I already sent, was to talk about the fixed routes, uh, the uh, CATA routes that we're going to be putting in to support the microtransit when, uh, when fall kicks off. Um, we did hear a lot from folks out in, in this area. We did a number of rounds of public input over the last few months, uh, trying to get a feel for uh, what people were seeing, what they might be hearing from their employers. Um, and so we did get some input about the need for some way for folks to get up to, a direct way to get up to campus. So originally we had planned on something that would have gone out of maybe like in the rudder air, rudders area. Um, our process, our thinking back then was a number of trips, trying to get a number of trips, putting them in a location that we could turn them around quickly and give people access to the university. Um, but what we were hearing from folks is they um, would rather have less trips, but coming more out of the center of Belfont. So that's what we're going to give a try here in the fall. Um, we're looking at two trips. Um, we're going to have a route. So in the in the prior to the pandemic, when we did have uh, fixed route services. We had an XB and an XG, but they were sort of designed, they went in big loops. So sometimes if you were just trying to get over here, you had to ride all the way through this way to get there or all the way back to, to get to the other side. Uh, so these two particular routes, the XB and the XG, have been reformatted. Uh, they'll be standalone routes, so the one going to Belfont will just come into Belfont and back out to downtown and connections with the, with the university. Um, and then in Pleasant Gap, we're going to have a standalone route over there as well uh, to help those folks get there. Um, and we're looking at uh, timing. We haven't figured out the exact timing yet. Uh, this information I sent you is sort of like where we're working towards. Uh, we're still determining all of the stops that we'll actually hit with these routes. Again, part of the idea is to speed this up and get people where they need to go um, up near the university and downtown State College for, for employment. And uh, we'll be looking at getting people into those areas prior to 8 o'clock and prior to 9 o'clock, and then bringing people back out after 4 and after 5. So a very much a commute kind of trip. What I thought I would do after just talking in generalities about that is really see if you might have questions. I wasn't sure what you would want to hear, so I figured I would send about as much information as I could and then just make sure we could answer questions for you if you have any uh, for this fall. Hi. Hi. Uh, we've met more than once. Uh, thank you very much for all the statistics that are in this report. It really helps to see where your peak times are and also the maps of where people are going, getting picked up and dropped off. Um, I have a couple of questions about the inbound. The service area that you have around the mall, you have six what you call points mm -hmm. uh, for drop off and pickup of the Catago service. Are you, you're still going to have Catago service to the Mount Nittany Medical 
center on Park Avenue. Yes. Okay. Um, it's on, sort of way off that map. So you right. It's but that <laughs> yes. that option is still available yes, to people. Is. Okay. On the inbound XB, the second run in the morning that comes through town about eight o'clock in the morning and goes up Bishop Street, is that going to coincide with the drop off for the students at the Catholic school? I don't know that. Does anybody know, know what that. time that drop off? Yeah, that's I, no, I said I wasn't. I'm not I sure just, on that time. I was looking back just to see if anybody knew that. That is not something that's been brought to our attention. Okay, um, because so if we there get information is, on it, we can see whether how un, it aligns. Right. Unlike the high school, there is no. They don't have a parking lot. It's all on street, and the school buses get backed up there. And I'm just wondering if that second run is going to coincide with the student drop off. Um, so that might mean a, a slight adjustment in. And it may it turn out that a cat -a go kind of approach might be a better option than the fixed route for that as well, but I, I'm not sure. Okay, and with the bus now running up Bishop Street to Wilson, are there any planned uh, additional stops like between uh, Allegheny and Blanchard? I know there's one right at Blanchard Street going out, but between Allegheny and Blanchard and also on Wilson Street between Bishop and Howard. So right now we haven't determined where mm -hmm. the stops are going to be. Uh, there will likely be less stops than we had when we had fixed route. Mm -hmm. um, but we can take input on what whatever the, the group feels like we need to know okay. about stops and locations. But uh, right. because that's once, all still in development. Once you get past the Bishop Street part of the loop, it's basically the old inbound fixed street service. It would be the same same route. Um, I, and I really like that. Um, you have an early morning outbound from SCLO because that'll give somebody an opportunity if they work in okay. Belfont or need to get here, they can get here in time to work. And there's also return in the evening. And the two inbounds in the evening will give people an opportunity to get to State College and then use the M bus and Catago to get home. So that, that I think that's a great addition. Okay. Thank you. So I'm not sure you remember we're looking at re revamping the diamond area and one of the things that we're doing is moving a crosswalk down to directly in front of where the bus stop is on West High. Okay. So that bus stop will need to be moved at least a little bit and it may need to be moved somewhere else. So that's going to have to be a discussion. Definitely just let us know when you start looking at where they said so, so if we can get involved in that, we'll, that'll help a great deal. There's so much information. <laughs> so, I think this is terrific, and I think this is the success of this is really going to depend on people getting on the bus because the ridership numbers will determine whether or not it continues. And I think, too, it'll be um, folks trying the Catago and, and realizing one of the things that I, I don't think I pointed out as much in the memo. Um, before we did Catago, we sort of had a feeling that um, there was probably some latent kind of need for travel around um, Belfont, and that is one of the things we've seen in Catago is there's a lot of usage to move around Belfont, a lot even higher than what we expected. So that's been very successful in, in the Catago service. Well, 50,000 trips is pretty good. We're pretty excited about that. <laughs> Any other questions for the I, I attended those two, both those meetings, and I wasn't impressed with the first one, and I, because I didn't think this was going to go anywhere. But when I saw this next report come out after the second meeting that we had, and the, the amount of people that were supporting, a, you know, a different view than what originally came out, and you listen to it and you show it on paper now, I think that that's very good. I think that was, uh, I think people should be happy, and if they're the ones who are really interested in it, they'll be on that bus. Mm -hmm. So I think since we have seen that here, could you quickly go over what the, yeah, in a general overview, what the, the plan is so that the public who is listening understands where Catago goes and what the fixed routes are, and that's so that they understand how, how it will all work together. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to bring up, uh, I'd like to bring up the guy that's really sort of running that program. I think he can do a much better job of it than I, I can, so. <laughs> I'll turn it over to Derek hey, to talk about that. How are we all doing? Um, so 
what we're what we're doing in the fall is we've condensed the the zone itself to just shy of shallow road but in place of taking out walmart and the mall we've added destination points inside that area um one is at sam's club one's at big lots um, one's at the pharmacy side of walmart the other one is the hm stop inbound um, near ross the Walmart, and then there'll be a stop near McDonald's area, and also the VA hospital, and including the Mount Nittany Medical Center. Um, so the route itself um, will come up, um, up high, take a right on Allegheny, go out Bishop, left on Wilson, down Lynn, back on Allegheny to um, the Y, and then right back out again, downtown. Um, we picked, uh, College and Allen as a location for the first stop. Um, the reason for that was is that this allows a blue loop, which is less populated during that time, rather than dropping off at Stadium West, which is a higher population of ridership. Um, so v people will be able to go up around one way of campus and also connect to community routes there. And then the bus will go up to School Library, will be able to connect to the white loop, go on the opposite side of campus, and also connect to the rest of our community routes. Um, the, we're increasing the HM to 30, 30 yep, thank minutes. Thank you. Yes. We're increasing the HM out of uh, Walmart to every 30 minutes. That way, during <clears throat> those off times of commuter level, people will be able to take Catago down to Walmart, pick up the HM on an every 30 minute basis. Um, so those people that aren't morning or night commuters um, grad students, so on and so forth, which you do have, you know, decent amount here. We definitely found that out last year during Cat when we started with Catago, how many grad students are actually here. Um, that uh, that'll help those people get back and forth between Belfont and Downtown State College, also, and vice versa. Um, I mean, that's that's pretty much in a nutshell how we're, you know, the zone itself is changing a little bit out here. Um, part of that is to mesh cat ride and cat go together um, because of the route and the three quarter mile off of the route that we have um, and we're working with eco lane right now to tighten that up but what you see in there is probably about 98 percent accurate there may be some slight adjustments to that in the end um, but if you know that's that's exactly what we're doing with everything um, we do believe um, given the feedback we got um, this is a good plan. Um, we, like anything, and if you haven't noticed, over the last year and a half, we've made slight adjustments as we keep going. Um, as we watch ridership change, um, as we watch times change, uh, peak, peak ridership times, that's been fairly consistent. That's finally you know, coming into a, a range that we're confident in. Um, and then you know what our old ridership with the XB XG routes, uh, that's how we came up with the commuter level um, time. So, is there any questions on that? I'll just add a couple. Of oh yeah. <clears throat> to that, so he mentioned Ecolane, and that's the software we use oh, yes, uh, to do some of the dispatching of our CATA ride, ride <laughs> service. Um, but also, uh, you know, one of the things that we'll definitely have to keep an eye on is all of this has happened during the pandemic. So we've tried to set this up with trying to guess what's going to happen in the fall. Um, we don't know for sure whether it'll be every, you know, every class will be back in person at Penn State or whether it'll be a portion and whether all the folks that work at Penn State are going to be back in, in person working or whether there'll be some hybrid, uh, you know, um, approach to working. So we'll be watching the numbers. We, uh, we, you know, we look at it monthly, trying to figure out what the trends are, but um, it's still going to be a guessing game in the fall, just like it was last fall. So bear with us as we try and figure out how things are going to work as we come out of this pandemic. So. I just, I was wondering how, if you have a sense of how this pilot program compares to other microtransit programs around the country. I know we, um, we have some idea of how it's compared to others that have been done by the same company that we're with. Yeah. Um, you want to talk it's, about that really quickly? Um, it's a hard comparison. Um, and the reason I say that, for example, um, Kansas City, for example, has one. Um, they operate in a 55 square mile area. 
Um, they have wait times of 40 minutes on average. Um, we have wait times, as you saw, you know. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's hard comparison. Um, also, the, the other thing you have to realize is that most of these places have been doing this are expanding. Um, that's not what we did. Um, we look to s supplement and replace. Um, and improve. Yeah, and improve. Yeah, exactly, which we have. Um, but it, it is a hard comparison. Um, Rabbit Transit, one of the closest ones to us, they've expanded. Um, so as far as I could tell, and I'm not saying that we, at least we're at least towards the front of doing more of what we're doing than a lot of other companies because they are all expanding, which, which I could totally understand why they're doing that. Now, COVID has changed a lot of things. Um, we have a lot of, there's a lot of places, and I can't remember the one I just read, um, <laughs> too many of them. We're constantly um, reading studies exactly. on what other people are doing. They've actually eliminated almost 85% of their fixed route and replaced it with microtransit. Now, does that mean that's going to work for everyone? No. Well, it's right. their system that worked for, um, and it seems to be working. Would it work for here? No, I don't think so, and I don't think we'll want to think so either. But, <laughs> I mean, it's... It really depends on you know the makeup of the area and Belfont fit the script. Um, we believe Bullsburg fits the script, which is why we're expanding there. Um, does you know does the V route? Probably not, to be honest. I mean you know, <laughs> you know when you're running many that many people. yeah exactly. Otherwise you're going to have you know too many congestion of Catago vehicles running up and down Atherton. Um, but yeah, it's. So I didn't really answer your question, so I apologize, but that's the best answer I can give you. Yeah. I just wondered since this was a whole new concept for Center County. Yeah. One but of the things that we have heard uh, very clearly is our approach that we took early on in Belfont with the education piece is over and above what others have done, and I think that's part of the reason that it did take hold and continued to grow throughout the pandemic. Yeah, that was, a, that was something that we learned through the research process is a lot of one of the complaints a lot of people had was they didn't put enough out there um so we really pushed that uh, that aspect thank you, thank you. Oh. I, just to say, uh, I think you guys have done really well combining the two i love the catago i used to use it all the time when i was working and uh with the, the fixed routes i think that's going to be fabulous thanks for listening oh thank you Any other questions, Morgan? Uh, thank you for listening to our residents. I know yes. that it couldn't have been all pleasant, but I feel like you've made a good effort to compromise with our residents, so I appreciate that. And, and hearing that you're willing to look at the numbers in the future and adjust them is very reassuring to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. So we have five minutes before we can start the regular meeting. So do what you need to do in the next five minutes. <laughs>
Good evening, everyone. The uh, July 19th Belfont Borough Council meeting is called to order. We had a work session uh, dealing with CATA services and a bridge repair over, mill, over the mill race uh, on High Street uh, just prior to this. Um, we'll have a uh, Pledge of Allegiance, moment of silence, followed by a roll call. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America into the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Ms. Abbott. Here. Mr. Eaton. Here. Ms. Lombardsky. Here. Mr. Johnson. Present. Mr. Prendergast. Here. Mr. Holderman. Present. Ms. Costi Vasey. I'm here. Ms. Cleeton. Here. Mr. Brackbill. Here. Mayor Wilson. Present. Need a motion and a second to approve the minutes. So move Brackbill. Second, Eaton. Brackbill and Eaton. Any changes? Seeing none. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, so move. <laughs> Next is the consent agenda. Um, I would like to remove the first three items, and so could we have a motion for the remaining three items? I'll make that motion. Eaton. I'll second it. Cleeton. Eaton and Cleeton. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, so move. The reason I asked to have these three, and it was just to have a question answered before we passed it. And I, uh, what I was looking over, knowing that we just recently gotten the American Rescue Fund plans, funds, I was wondering where they were are or where they where they will be appearing in these three reports because I could not figure out how they would be placed in these reports going forward mm -hmm. for the next couple of years. I think Lori brought them in and under the general, but she was going to create their own uh, its own uh, line item. She might not have done that yet. Okay. Well. We'll have on the online item. And, then, and that will be spread out between the sewage and general at this point, correct? Well, the whole three, I think it was 326, 24,000 will be, it's in the general now, but she's going to move it to its own line item. And then everything that we do will come out of that. Okay, but they'll all be within the general at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, that was, that was the only question. Um, so could we have a motion for these three items? I'll make that motion, Cleeton. I'll, I'll second it. And friendly guys. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, so move. Okay. Bring communications. The first item is an, a request uh, for it's called the annual Dylan Krunick. Memorial Charity Baseball Tournament. The request is to use Governor's Park on August 14th and 15th, pretty much the whole day, 7 a.m. to dusk. Uh, they're asking for fee waivers since it's a charity tournament. Okay. Um, do I have a motion to approve the use of the baseball field at Governor's Park from 7 a.m. to dusk, both August 14th and 15th, with the registration fee to be waived? I'll make that motion, Hamboski. Second. Hamboski and Prendergast. I have one question. Do they have a certificate of insurance? Yeah. Uh, they, they will. We'll, we'll make it a requirement before we, when we send out the letter. Okay. No. They, typically, we waive the, when it's a local nonprofit. Yeah. Not the insurance. Not the insurance, but we waive the fee for local nonprofits. Yes. Based. Yeah, this isn't. This is out of Canandaigua, New York. There's a resident mm -hmm. that has. Uh, no, you're it. talking about the, the, next, the one. next one. Next yeah. one. Is it the next one? Yes. 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 Oh, yes. oh, okay. I'm sorry then. Yes. No, my bad. Yes. My bad. Okay. Any other discussion? 
Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, so moved. The next one's the one John State talking about. It's called the Seventh Annual Happy Valley Showdown Youth Baseball Tournament. It's a for-profit tournament. And they're asking to use Governor's Parks Fields for August 7th and 8th, and they are willing to pay the fee. So I'll make that motion to them. I'll second it. Brackville and Brenda Gast. And they have also uh, said that they will be submitting their certificate of insurance. Yes. So uh, is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? So moved. Belfont Area School District Cross Country is requesting the use of Governor's Park for practices and meets. There's a number of days and uh, spread out in the fall of this year, 2021. They're looking for approval. So I need a motion to approve the Belfont Area School District Cross Country Team use of Governor's Park on the dates and times requested in their letter between August 16th and September 28th with the registration fee again to be waived. I assume that the, you need a motion. And I'm a second just part. saying. I'm assuming that there's no conflicts in these dates. That's part of the discussion. So we still need a motion. I'll make, I'll make the motion. <laughs> I'll so, second it. Gas and Namaski. Now ask your question. <laughs> I just did. Is there a conflict with any of these dates? Not that we're aware of. Okay. We, we can state that in the letter that you know, should there be a conflict, they they can work it out. Sounds good. Anything else? Any other questions? Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? So moved. Next item is just a note uh, for your information. We will not be able to use the Rockview inmates to cut the Union Cemetery uh, grass. That, that's all being done by our personnel this year. Uh, hopefully, you know, next year we'll be able to return to using the assistance of the Rockview inmates, but this year's uh, not possible. Next item. Hey, yes. Can I ask you a question there? Sure. They paved the roads up there. I know the cemetery never had any money. Who paid for the roads up there? I think uh, uh, people can speak to that better than uh, I can. There was a private donation given uh, to the Belfont Historic Preservation Foundation. It is an anonymous donation, uh, and uh, that was. Yeah, I just wondered because I know they never had any money when I was on council. <laughs> I thought, where did they got the money to pay yeah, the It was a place. very yeah. generous anonymous oh, donation. Thank you. Did yes. that pay for the new signage, too? Is there new signage in there? Uh, there is a new sign. Yeah. I, I'm assuming that it did. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to that previous question, no, the, the DC-8 fund is out of Canandaigua, New York. So that's not a local nonprofit. The, there's an applicant that lives in the borough that's filling it's, out the application. You're talking oh, about the okay. Dylan Krunick Memorial Charity? Yeah. Yeah, that local resident is filling out the application. There, okay. I believe, I believe yeah. they're using that address, John, because that's where the family moved. Okay. Okay. It's just when I looked for the nonprofit, that's where the address came up for. Okay. So. Just so we don't get into a future problem with location of the nonprofit. We, we try to look at the applicant where they're from. Okay. Yes. Okay, next item. Uh, there is a concern with North Thomas and West High Street intersections as well as some Half Moon Hill area intersections. They're uh, requesting council look at uh, safety issues. Uh, I'd like to refer this to the Streets Committee. More work for you, Mary. <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> Next item, Kepler Pool. There was an inquiry about whether it's uh, for sale or not. I'm, I'm suggesting Council clear the air on that or refer them to the Recreational Authority. Ralph, if I can, I, yes. I, I spoke to our representative who sits on the Nittany Valley Recreation Authority. They knew nothing about it either. Uh, he, uh, he said no one on the committee knew anything about 
the fact that that rumor, how that rumor got started. I think your response to it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well. So, do we need a motion to send a letter clarifying ownership of what might happen? Should I, I think uh, Ralph already did? I, I did email them back and say I was going to let council know, but uh, I think they're clarified. I, I will. I can always hit another reply that uh, we confirmed there's no interest or no sale. Because just an email that I could okay. Yes, happy to do okay. that. So no motion needed. Yes. <clears throat> Next item of Belfont Borough's 2010 to 2014 community development block grant contracts were submitted as closeouts and they were all accepted. We received a letter. I uh, basically saying that uh, I certainly want to recognize Don's efforts in managing those contracts. Uh, even the, the grant administrator noted uh, Don's uh, superb efforts to manage those contracts. So, I'd like uh, to job well done. Don's but your work's not done. Because <laughs> <laughs> okay. the next one's all yes. CCD. <laughs> next, yes, yes. Uh, it, what, what, uh, 21st, so is that Wednesday? Wednesday. Yes, sir. Wednesday. yes there's a, what we're getting at is there's a community development block grant public hearing July 21st, Wednesday night, 6 p.m. at the Willow Bank building. And they're going to go over a couple other projects, but Belfont's project is moving funds for uh, West Bishop Street, South Spring Street intersection for safety improvements there. So there's no action needed if you're interested in attending or if anybody is, it's a public meeting. The next item is a thank you letter from the Belfont Senior Class of 2021. Anyone that helped uh, them have their uh, senior ball in, in Cali Ram Park on May 31st, they're saying thanks to Next item is the Center County Planning Office wrote a letter back to Benner Township in regard to their zoning amendments, zoning changes, and I, I don't believe there's any action. They're just uh, keeping the other municipalities in the Nittany Valley region in the loop. The next item is in regard to a, a Belfont Chambers uh, raising issues about the, the need for high resolution cameras. I know we have the chamber director here in the audience, uh, but, and he may want to speak under rural comments, but it, it's just a request to look into or purchase high resolution cameras for the Teleram Park area. So let me ask a question and I can, we can figure out what to do next. Mm -hmm. Is the area where these tables look at, is that considered to be part of the park or part of the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, oversight? We've always said underneath the eaves or around the train station was part of the train station chamber area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, then I think what we need to do is refer this to Parks and Rec and include DBI, Chamber of Commerce, and Chief Weaver in the discussion so that we've got all of the parties mm -hmm. that have oversight or concerns to work together to, to try to make rent. And it may be that some of the funds may come from the borough, but other funds may have to come from somewhere else. Yes. So that's what I would like to have done. And then, Gary, during the oral comments, you can make any additional comments you'd like. Uh, right now? So no. We're, well, probably, because I think this is the last yeah. item. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can go up and, okay. and talk. <laughs> This started out um, being about the co-working space and the furniture under the eaves of the train station. Uh, that's what brought it to, to the forefront now, but there's, it's been a problem for a while. We've had like our electric outlets broken into so that uh, kids can charge their, their cell phones. There have been times that the police have asked us to shut down our open Wi-Fi because it's being used for nefarious purposes. So it is difficult as stated in, in the letter that I wrote, for the police to patrol the entire area of the park. And that's pretty well known. So a variety of crimes could be committed down there and go completely undetected because it's, it's very difficult to patrol. The only answer to that is to have something 
that you could identify the people that did it after the fact and when they did it, so that there's some reasonable expectation of, of people knowing that, that they will be seen and they will be caught, and then that would shut it down. It would be beneficial for our visitors and our citizens to know that uh, they're protected by that at any time. In this day and age, you can never tell what's going to happen when. So it started out about the eaves under the train station, but it's a more general problem out in the gazebo. There, there's frequently trash and litter, and there's been some damage out there. And there's a good possibility, well, there's also been damage to, to some of the Railroad Society equipment that's along the, the track there. I remember coming down one time and stopping a couple of kids who had a campfire going underneath the, 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 uh, um, the snowplow, for example. So, um, and I think it's generally known. I mean, I go out and talk to kids and I say, look, um, this is our town's visitor center. And if you go out there and you throw around the F sharps and you present an aggressive appearance, you're going to intimidate people from coming in here and it's going to reflect very poorly uh, on our community. And I've got some cooperation from some. And other ones have told me, well, you know, what are you, what are you concerned about? This is the effing park. I have a right to be here. And, you know, I don't want to be calling the police every time that there's an incident down there or that um, we have concerns for people blocking the entranceways or, or uh, causing a problem for uh, visitors coming in, into the train station. So it's not just the train station. It's the gazebo. It's other areas of the park. And it's a problem that, that seems to crop up, especially in the summer, when when kids aren't in school, but it could happen any time, any day, any season, and at any hour of the day. And to cover an area as, as large as, as the park, the only way I could think of to do it is to um, uh, have high resolution cameras. Right now we have, I think, two cameras that are, are focused around the, the under part of the train station. So there's two sides that are sort of uncovered completely. The, the railroad track side, there's no camera looking at it. The, uh, the park side, there is a camera looking at it, but if you review the tapes, you could tell anybody doing anything would be roughly humanoid, but uh, that's about it. You know, it's difficult to identify any specific person. When our windows were broken down there, the police were able to review the, the tapes, find out what time it was done. They couldn't identify who did it, but they, they talked to their compatriots who were on patrol that night in order to get uh, an idea of who was out and about and seen. All right, so the, the point of that is, by confronting those people and telling them that they were on camera, they actually confessed, and they caught the people, but they didn't tell them that we couldn't really identify you. This is, this is speculation. And, and that's why I think, you know, this is going on for quite a while, and, and uh, we need to address it in some fashion. So that's, that's why I wrote the letter. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there, is there anyone else who wants to make public comment at this time? Okay, in that case we'll move on to Office of Community Affairs. Uh, just, I'll quickly skim over this. We do have Gina Thompson with us here uh, to answer any questions you might have. There was no planning commission meeting on July 12th, no items on their agenda. There was no HARB meeting on July 13th, same idea. Uh, Mr. Brooks's report has been sent out, was sent out, I believe, over the weekend or possibly today. And uh, if you have any questions, Mr. Brooks is here as well. So uh, we did include the rental housing information in this area. Let us know if that's an appropriate area or not, but it's there. Uh, let us know if you have any questions. Okay. On the codes enforcement, there is a very long list of what appears to be uh, the rental permits within the borough. My question is, is this an exhaustive list or only a list of the permits that expire within the next 12 months? I believe it's an exhaustive list, I believe, but the, or maybe it's the ones you're in, inspecting. We have, we probably have, uh, I would say about 1,500 units in the borough individual units and probably about 500 properties that are rental properties. Go ahead, Gina. Could you repeat your question again? Okay. Uh, when I was looking over the list, I looked at the dates of expiration and I saw dates ranging from like June 30th, 2021 through June 30th or a little bit later, 2022. My question was, is this the complete list of all the rental properties? 
or is it just those that are expiring within this year? Because I thought that there was a three-year cycle and there was third, third, and third. My understanding from code, but I can get clarification for you, is that that is the rental property inspections to date. Is that what you're referring to, the rental inspection? Yeah. yeah. That section. Yeah. But so. Is that a full list or is that just a <gasps> Or is that just the one year list? I believe it's just the one year list, but I'm but I can I, I can certainly check and get back to you. It would be very, very helpful if we did have a full list, particularly when we go down to this short term rental thing to have know what we have and what we don't have. Well in the the other document is the complete list of rentals. So there's two documents, I believe, in your in your packet. There's the updated inspections document and then there's the rental list to date well, I looked at the very end of yeah when I looked there my only saw dates of 21 and 22 I didn't see any other dates in okay there. so that's so, why I was asking okay the so question. it is the, the there's one document that is the complete rental list and those are renewed annually so that's why they have the the renewal date of 2022 okay um, but also in there and that's what I was confused about is is the inspections to date that get done that are constantly ongoing by code okay. so and what I'm doing now since I started in March is keeping track of I can't right now I can't retroactively find out where short-term rentals are I mean I can unofficially like of course I can go on Airbnb and, and those sorts of um, websites but I can't retroactively figure out which rentals are short-term rentals because we never had a system that identified that. But what I have done since coming in, I think I did it in about April, is I revamped the permit application. So if they are applying for a new rental, they have to indicate whether it is a long-term rental or a short-term rental. And as of now, of course, you know, both are allowed. So, you know, it's just to, have a record keeping system so that now from here on out I can start to keep track of short term rentals in the borough. Okay. The second question I had was that when looking through it several of the permits said quote apartment and BB, which I assume meant bed and breakfast. Uh, um what what does the BB mean? I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. I can check on that though. Because yeah. if it's 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 not bed and breakfast because there's a lot of those indicators. Um, to be honest, I I don't know. I, I it's one of those questions that when I've looked at the list, I thought, oh, you know, when I have a moment, I'll call or email Amy Wagner and ask her what the BB stand for, and then honestly, I just forget and then don't do it. Um, I've speculated what that means, but I'm not sure. So I can find out from code what BB stands for. Yeah, that would be helpful. Yeah, yeah. I don't believe it stands for bed and breakfast, though. Because there's an awful lot of things that don't qualify right. as that, that were listed with, as with BB on. Right, right, yeah. yeah. So. so, okay. Are you, are you looking at the document that's like maybe 10 font and then the other document that maybe is 2 font? Yes. <laughs> it's, yes. It, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I hesitate what to, you know, what to include in the packet because that is a huge document. I don't know whether it's something you guys care to see. Um, you know, same thing with the, with the building code reports. There's no way to break out Belfont Borough. Um, short of like taking a screenshot of just our section and then making a PDF and including that in the packet. Um, I figure more information <laughs> is better for you guys, but if this, if these documents are, you know, not necessary for your review, you can let me know. Um, yeah, they're just, they're just the reports that I get from Center Region Code on a monthly basis. So when I get them, I just throw them into the yeah, uh, sure. You know, and they're informative. I thought it might help us with some of the issues we're having around rentals mm -hmm. by ha having that kind of information. Yeah. But not understanding the nomenclature was a little bit hard to understand. Sure, sure. And I'm still learning it myself as well. So, um, but yeah, I think, you know, between Center Region Code, myself, and Harry, I think that we're really doing a good job of kind of staying on top of mm -hmm. rentals in the borough. Yes. and being more um, 
aware of maybe some problem issues that we have and then addressing them in a, in a more uh, expedient process than before. So um, I think it's been, I think it's been positive so far. And like I said, um, I'm starting to keep track of short-term rentals. So in the future, we at least have that data because it does really bother me that we don't at least have a number in our, at our fingertips of how many short-term rentals are in the borough. It's just sort of a guessing game at this point. Thank you. Go ahead, Brandon. I think for the, for the rental, for the main rentals, all the rentals, I don't know if that needs to be to council every month. I think if you make a change, whether you add something or take something away, then it gets updated. Right. But, but to do it every month, I think it's kind of a waste of your time to go through that and send it out. Yeah. I mean, it's so just to be clear, like this is coming from Center Region Code. So it's it's not a document that I create. Um, and typically, you know, these are just like I said, this is just they update it, you know, because every month you might have a rental unit that um, there's this whole process with code, but they may um, not have, they may have let their rental permit expire and then that doesn't get updated until like that happens, they catch that in June, so then it gets updated in July or August. And so there is, there is minimal changes to these lists um, as they do inspection, that, get, that gets updated. And then when there are new rentals or rentals that have expired, that gets updated. But more or less, these lists don't change too much month to month. I'd say year to year, you're going to see the biggest change. So, Randy says a periodic information would be helpful. Right. But you, like if you ask for them quarterly, I'm not going to be able to, I, I would just end up giving you June, July, August, September. You know, there's no way to really compile all of them. So you'll still be getting monthly reports, but you may not be getting them every month. But that's up to you guys. So, from, from my perspective, this doesn't help me because I can't. Or my brain can't complex, <laughs> comprehend it. It's too much. Yeah. And my problem with it is it has nothing to do with Gina. Like now that we're seeing Harry's reports, that's what I want from Center Region Code. This does nothing to help me understand the health of our rental uh, properties in this town. If they're going to send us something that's like 10 pages of three million characters, mm -hmm. I'd want to see something that says fail, pass, 80%, 70%, 60%. Something that tells me that something's been re-inspected, failed inspection, this doesn't help me have any understanding other than there's a lot of properties that are rental. So I don't know how to communicate that to code. I doubt it's gonna anything's gonna change. They're gonna say like, we can't do this report. But I would appreciate it if they could give us more of an update on the health. This is different than the reports that they were giving us where at least they gave us a broke down, breakdown of what was reinspected, like six numbers, that was more illustrative of what was going on than this to me. I thought, I thought British Center Region broke Belfont out of their figures at one time. They do, they but it's very minimal, very minimal. Like number of permits issued and stuff like that. But, but, and they don't tell yeah. us like, they, it, uh, it does not tell you the health and just mm -hmm. getting those like six numbers was like we were asking for the world and I I still don't feel like after seeing what Harry does like I feel like there's so much more analytical data that they can give to us that has to be able to be pulled out from their software that would be more helpful than this is it yeah, we don't want raw data is it possible to send uh, Harry's report because you're, you're right Melissa sure. it is a Harry it's an excellent yeah. graphic report of what's going on and gives us numbers, it gives us percentages, and it tells us where the problems are. Mm -hmm. uh, is there, could we send that to yes. code to say that this is something like what we would like to see you doing with the other part of the codes? Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I had thought uh, in the past that they were giving us that type of information that you had brought up, so I don't know when it changed or why. I, this is the first I've seen this this report in this manner because 
it looks like it's maybe just missing a column or something of, you know, of your yeah. pass and fail suggestion. Some uh -huh. information. This is just like a census breakdown of what's happening. It's well, it has the dates that they're all inspected, but it doesn't give you the outcome of the inspection. Yeah. Do you know if the address is the management company or the owner? Uh, the the first are you the first address? Oh, the right. once you get over to that lists the owner, yeah. then the management company, then it lists an address and a location. Do right. we know if that's the address and location of the management company or the owner? I'm pretty sure that it's the management company because that's typically who code will contact first when there's okay. issues. So, um, but again, I, I can check on that to make sure. But yeah, I, I believe it's the management company. I would, if I saw an example, I'd probably be able to tell you. But um, just because I'm getting very familiar with the okay. the management companies and the and the owners, um, so I start to recognize addresses now. But um, I do believe it's the management company. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's just I I I'd seen some in areas where they suffer with blight problems, the location of the owner oftentimes can be quite well removed when in, in the problem properties are the ones usually with the most remote owners mm -hmm. so yeah and code does to their credit they do require that um, there be a local property manager at least so that's that's helpful you know um, but it, yeah I would tend to agree yeah Anything else? I'm good. Okay, I'm good too. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yep. Gina. So, um, so there's no more on Office of Community Affairs. If not, we'll move on to Mayor Wilson's report. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Thank you. As some of you know, I uh, attended the uh, 50th anniversary of Pennsylvania State Mayor's Association uh, Convention in Pittsburgh uh, the last few days, or Thursday, Friday. I had to come back Saturday, so I missed the Saturday sessions, but I think Joanne is going to cover that. Um, you know, just some of the highlights. Um, we did have a couple speakers that... Uh, um, that were very entertaining. I mean, the, the opening night speaker was uh, the uh, president and chief executive officer of the, the John Heights uh, History Center, and probably one of the best presentations that I've ever seen. It was uh, it was just well done and covered a lot of history of uh, the city of Pittsburgh. Not, but that was more entertainment. Um, the first uh, speaker that we had on Friday was uh, Chief ec uh, Economist from PNC Financial Services. And uh, just a couple of statistics, he, he said that 22 million jobs were lost during COVID. And um, their project projection of recovery is that in 21, um, the, um, you know, we should go up 7% uh, with our um, GDP or whatever it's called, and up 3% in 22. But if you watched anything on the stocks today, I, I'm hoping he's right. And, and what's going on right now is is a blip, but there's some panic going on. So the recovery may not be what they predict. Um, Kerry Benninghoff spoke, uh, did a real nice job uh, answering some questions regarding the RAR Coalition, which has been in the process and been championed by the Mayor's Association probably the last I know it's been at least 10 years. Uh, the, the, how, the bill is going as, about as far as it can get, but they can't get enough votes to pass it. And uh, so it's just sort of sitting there. And uh, the recommendation is that uh, all, the, all the boroughs, townships that want this um, radar uh, should lobby their local or their state legislators. Uh, in order to get them on board. We are, I mentioned this before, but I think it's worth saying again, we are the only state in the nation that doesn't have local radar, only, which is, let me tell you something. Um, 
But uh, I just want to sum this up a little bit. There's uh, some other things that I'm sure you're really not that interested in. But uh, I, I, I want to say that the value of uh, the mayor's convention is the opportunity to speak with other mayors of like size uh, municipalities and do some comparing on what their issues are in their municipalities as opposed to what our issues are here. And uh, I got to tell you, we're not alone with our issues uh, from infrastructure to fireworks uh, or uh, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, just, just on, you know, the most current thing that I've been talking about is the, the fireworks. And I have taught, I did uh, have a committee meeting uh, and there were a couple mayors there and we, someone brought up the subject, it wasn't me, but they started to talk and um, two of the mayors, um, one from, let's see, one from, I think, Lancaster and another one from um, uh, Duray Borough in Luzerne County, uh, they both have fireworks ordinance, ordinances and they're going to send those to me so we can take a look at them or Ralph can take a look or our solicitor can take a look and uh, I think maybe they have theirs because you know they're they may be more spread out than we are and the 150 foot thing doesn't do them any good but anyhow I thought it was worth taking a look at um, and uh, I think that's about it I have some other things I could tell you about but I don't think they're of any real interest uh, I will I'm, I'm gonna send an email out about one of the topics though to everybody um, Chief is ill, and he called in and said that he is, uh, if we needed anything, uh, I could call him. So if you have any issues for the chief, please give them to me, and I will pass them along. I already made the note that we placed them on a committee meeting, or a committee uh, with uh, Parks, DBI, Chamber, and uh, the chief. So I'll pass that on to him. Okay. Anything? Questions for the mayor? I have a question. Mr. Coleman, this is right about networking with other boroughs, because when I used to go to the PSAB conferences, I said every borough, no matter whether you're 900 people or you're 40,000 people, we all have the same problems. It's just on a different scale, and it's good to talk to other people there and get to their ideas or what they've done to maybe exactly. take care of the problem, same that's, problem you have now. The biggest value of the convention yes. is the interchange between the participants and to instead of us sitting here spinning our wheels and what are we going to do and how are we going to do it, you can talk to these guys and say, oh, well, we, we had that same issue last year and this is what we did and this is how it worked. So it's a, it's a shortcut to problem solving. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Um, so it's my turn for my report. Um, I also attended uh, the mayor's conference and did a presentation on our climate action plan with Heidi Kunka with the uh, uh, Department of Environmental Protection. It went well after a technical glitch. <laughs> uh, several people uh, afterwards thought they, that I handled the, the issues that we had with the, the technical problem pretty well. I gave away one printed copy of our plan to a mayor in Allegheny County and talked to about uh, five other municipalities. Um, and they may be contacting me to get a, further copies. I only brought one copy of the plan with me because it was kind of long and I didn't want to print out multiple copies. <laughs> um, then afterwards, I, uh, we stayed after to, to, uh, to after the second session so people could come up and talk to us and we talked about the newest uh, cohort of training that's starting in two weeks uh, which uh, and what they Heidi kept telling everyone was that Belfont is one of is their main shining star in this program so I thought that was very nice to hear uh, I had later on in the day I had lunch with the president of Wilkinsburg Borough Council and which had nothing to do with the conference, but it was has uh, both Tom and Buddy said it was a good networking uh, session. They're going having much harder problems in dealing with the possibility of, uh, of uh, merger. a merger that they don't want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, any questions on that? Okay, then I'll move on to the other meeting I attended. 
The Drive Electric Coalition meeting was held on Ju July 15th. I had about 10 pages of notes that I took, but I'm only going to talk about two, two of the items that were in the, that meeting. Uh, the first was a legislative update, and there were are there and two bills that are being considered in the General uh, Assembly regarding funding of roads and transportation. One bill, uh, it, that one is HB 948. It will change registration fees for EVs and hybrids by adding a $75 surcharge for hybrids and 175 surcharge to EVs to the annual car registration. There would be no changes in the gas ta taxes for internal combustion engine vehicles. The second bill is a little more forward-looking and because there's concern for both gas vehicles and for um, as they become more and more efficient, funds for based on gas taxes are becoming less and less available for highway repairs. So there's a second bill that's out that's going to start off with EVs with a five-year pilot to report annual mileage to the state when the vehicle is annually inspected, and then the person would either pay three cents per mile or $400 a year in lieu of all gas taxes. Owners could, would pay the full amount within 30 days of the inspection or they could set up a monthly payment through the pen, a PennDOT contracted vendor. If this works with the EVs, then all vehicles will be transferred over time uh, and all gas tax, taxes, both federal and state, will be eliminated. Uh, this helps not only uh, PennDOT, but it also helps people with less efficient gas vehicles because it will re actually reduce their travel costs. Um, research is showing that this will be especially beneficial for people in rural areas who own more of the older, less efficient gas vehicles. Uh, truck, they're also considering that trucks may have an added weight by mileage ra rate and considering because it says the heavier vehicles cause more road damage. That is still being discussed. There, um, they're looking at uh, what other states have done. Uh, the, bill is, the bill is still being written, and uh, they're hoping to get it in the ho Senate hopper in September. Uh, the second one item is that PennDOT is working on an EV mobility plan and report. Uh, it says more and more people are starting to move over to electric vehicles. Uh, they're trying to figure out how to make it more efficient and make it easier for people to get around. Uh, once they're drafting a plan, once that plan is completed, PennDOT will be re reaching out to the MPOs for additional guidance in each district. They believe that each district will have different needs or concerns, so that's why they're sending them out to the MPOs for your detailed uh, review. I'm not sure exactly sure when that's going to come, but when it does, you, you'll, you'll get it, Doug. Um, uh, and what this this program do is may actually result in more funding of charging infrastructure for destination uh, communities where installation costs are higher. The example they gave was uh, Williamsport. They said that most of the year there's not a whole lot of travel there, but when they get the Little League series, there are a lot of people and a lot more of them are coming in with electric vehicles and they don't have the infrastructure there to do it. And funding for those kinds of destination communities, just like ours, may be uh, a higher priority. And then finally, there looks to be an expansion of federal tax credits for both new and newly used EVs are being considered in Congress. So, any questions? Yeah, why am I going to buy an EV if I have to pay more to drive it than I do a one-ton Ford pickup truck with a crew cap? <laughs> I'd like to know how they're going to get the trucks traveling through the state. I don't know how they're going to that, verify mileage error. That was part of what the, their conversation is, and they're looking at with other states of how they're handling the cross-state uh, traffic. Yeah. That they didn't have the answer with. Well, I'm even really right not. as it stands now, if somebody doesn't stop for gas, right, they're not paying any of the tax anyway. Yeah. Right. No, but when you stop for gas, you're there maybe 15 minutes, not an hour, to charge your car. <laughs> and that's that's what I'm thinking about when you talk about infrastructure for the electric vehicle for charging and how long that's going to take and how much how much in, you know, how much improvement needs to be made to 
provide those spaces. But that's part of what that mobility planning thing is supposed to address. Well, a lot of the EVs, if you go into level, if you go to the high charge rate, they can get like 80% an hour or something. It's or less. Matter. Or less. I, I'm not an expert on that. I'm just saying, I'm just comparing the refueling time. You've got all the time in the world. You're retired. I know. <laughs> I don't want to wait to set that up. I don't either. But you're going to That's be why I got a hybrid. Whether you like it or not, you're going to be driving an EV. Maybe we take the Army part of the Army and we put a bunch of electric parking up there. It's a done deal, Randy. Powered by solar. It's a dumb deal. Randy, all you got to do is get so, a plug in. This is getting off topic. And then you got yeah, to call the get back yes, to her business. Is, yeah, yeah, this yeah. is getting off topic. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, Elon Musk's three, minute rule. three minutes. Yes. <laughs> so uh, we'll That's move right. on. <laughs> we'll move on to building a property. Frank? We didn't have a meeting, but I do, do well, I have two things I want to bring up. One, since we were talking about electric vehicles, and I've been talking about having them pay the fair share of when they're getting charged. Uh, last meeting, you, you mentioned about Pittsburgh uh, having electric vehicles out there, or electric charging stations out there. But anyway, long story short, I talked to the director of the Pittsburgh Parking Services, uh, Christopher Spears. They have basically three parking garages. They don't have any charging stations on the streets. But anyway, he said those fees for charging electric vehicles are included in the cost of parking in the garage, which you have to pay to get in the garage to park. So basically, and he said that electric vehicle charge is included in their price that they pay for the garage. And also, uh, last meeting, I think you said that we couldn't charge because we're under PUC or something. Anyway, I talked to uh, Joe, and I'm sorry I don't know his last name, from, from the PUC, and he says that they do not regulate electric charging stations. He, all they regulate is the companies that provide electricity, West Penn, or whatever. There, were, there was a mention at, that the, the rules are changing at this meeting. Well, I'm just telling you, I talked to him a couple of days ago. He said, we can charge anything we want for, for charging an electric vehicle in our parking lots. He said, it's just like anything else. You charge for water, sewer, whatever. He said, you can charge whatever you want to for, for charging it. I still don't think that the people parking on the streets should be subsidizing people charging their vehicles. Plus, they're getting free parking while they're doing it. So my suggestion, just my personal opinion, I charge twice what it costs to park a vehicle on the street. Uh, why, why should they get away with it? I mean, if, if one of those electric charging stations goes down, I don't know what the costs are. You guys might know. But it's surely not cheap to replace them. I mean, you've got to have something in that fund, and I don't know why people on the street would have to be charged for replacing those either. I'm not, uh, I, I just don't think it's fair, to be honest with you. So you can do with that what you want. Anyway, if you don't want to talk about that, I'll move on here. Uh, Dawn sent me some information about the parking downtown, which I have to admit I didn't have any knowledge of this new parking uh, uh, program that we're working on. But I'll read this for the public's use anyway, at least their information, if I can. Beginning two years ago, the borough embarked on a three-phase project to upgrade our parking in Belfont. The first phase was to provide structural upgrades to the missile lots north, south, and west. This phase cost the borough approximately $500,000 and included the installation of six kiosks which replaced 120 single-spaced parking meters. The removal of the meters allows the borough street staff to plow the lots and get them cleared in half the time. There's still some work that will be done in 2022 to the south lot before this phase is finalized. The second phase was to replace the old street meters with new street meters. This had to be completed because parts were no longer available for the older meters in addition. Older meters and in addition, more people wanted options to pay for parking through credit, debit cards, or their smartphone. We will have the touchless pay by phone option completed by early fall. Finally, phase three was to look at our red single space metered long term parking. Due to the cost of the new single space meters, it was cost prohibitive to try and replace those. So we instead, we decided to create a long-term parking area for residents and commuters. No longer do people have to constantly feed the meter. It is simply requires a one-time registration on our website where people can either set it up as a recurring expense or they have the option to do it monthly. The long-term parking spaces are designated with red paint and are designed for the downtown workforce to provide a cheaper parking area with the impact of freeing up downtown spaces for business patrons. 
These areas also provide one hour of free parking to anyone. The idea behind everything that has been done to date is to ensure we are doing all we can to make parking easier, more flexible, and provide maximum accessibility for patrons wanting to access the downtown businesses. We recognize there are challenges and many of those relate to the changes we have made. We will continue to listen to ideas and also monitor and evaluate, evaluate the borough parking as a whole. We do appreciate our residents' understanding and patience, patience as we continue to finish our efforts related to parking. Should anyone have questions related to parking, please feel free to contact the borough at 355-150 on extension 210. And I thank Dawn for providing that because a lot of information there that I didn't know about either. And uh, as part of this, my, I have a couple of questions too. And, and since I have been on council, I don't know what really is going on. I don't understand why the parking places are blocked off up at the diamond right now. I was told it's same kind of a safety issue yet. I don't know what it is. And I don't know what we're working on. I did see a preliminary design where we're putting some curbing in so there won't be parking there anymore. And I, I don't understand removing eight parking places when we're not providing eight new parking places. Now, if, I don't know who, how council's working this, but apparently I talked to Ms. Ms. Schuster from the downtown businesses, and she says they, downtown businesses, have no idea what we're doing with parking uptown. Nobody knows why the parking lots, parking spaces are blocked off, and they've had no direct communication with council. I would think somewhere along the line we need to talk to those downtown people because I think they should be involved in this process or what we're doing right now. I, I, in 1980, we had parking problems in Belfort. We still have parking problems in Belfort. Over the years, we had two parking studies. I thought we maximized every space we could find for parking, and now we're, we're removing parking. I, I'm sorry, but personally, I don't understand it. I mean, I, I, okay, there's a safety item, but one accident, one, I won't say one fatality, which is not once too many, but I can't see change in the downtown parking for for last for one basically one item. I'm sorry, personal opinion. Well, that was one of the discussions I had with uh, mayors. Uh, we, were, we were talking about some of the issues that are going on, and they wanted to know what we're doing in our borough. And I said, oh, well, you know, we're having we're having a study done to you know try to make more safe passage in in the borough. And they brought up, uh, well, you know. W w what was precipitating event? And I said, "Well, we had you know someone that got killed on a diamond," and they said, "Well, there was there were two people there were two people involved in that. There was the driver, and the pedestrian." Right. So you mentioned last week, it was 50-50. Yes, 50-50. Right. Okay. The pedestrian and and, and, uh, and you know, the pedestrian wasn't in crosswalks either. Right. And we have thousands and thousands and thousands of cars that go through that intersection. And we had one incident, and so here again, one more time. We have one complaint or one problem, I not to diminish the death, but I'm saying we're rolling over and spending a lot of money. I don't know, how much have we spent so far on this project? $30,000, all right. Uh, 30000 for the uh, for the materials that we're purchasing and maybe another fifteen in engineering costs, perhaps. Okay. Just putting that out, and we're reducing the parking spaces in town. And we continue to. And if I were a uh, borough business, I would be all over that. I think it's a disservice to the downtown businesses down here because, just like 40 years ago, everybody wants to park in front of the business they want to go in. They don't want to walk a block or two blocks. They certainly don't want to walk a parking lot or, or down at the train station, come up town to to visit those businesses. I, I personally, I still think it's a bad idea to get rid of those parking places. You guys can do what you want, but I don't I think it's a good idea. Buddy, but, you know, I don't have a vote, so, but I do represent a lot of people in town. I certainly think we need to bring the downtown business group in and talk to them or let somebody know what's going on because, according to her, nobody's talked to them at all. We do have, we are planning in, um, in September to have um, several public public meetings to discuss the changes that, that are happening and, and what, you know, what, what path um, people want. I think, yeah, I have a public meeting before you permanently block those spaces off because there might be a lot of downtown businesses not happening. So, well, that was kind of why we blocked 
the spaces off to begin with was to sort of, you know, to kind of give them a, a heads up that there was, there was so stuff happening. Let me have an angered comment. Like, what, tell me what, what has changed, what, what's changed without those spaces? What, what is, other than what are you doing, Belfon Borough? What businesses have suffered from the closing of those spaces? I, I didn't talk to businesses. I'm just telling you, I talked to the representative that, that represents those people. They don't know what we're doing downtown. Okay, so you have two to questions. Me, to me, you have two I, questions. I, they don't know what we're doing or we're eliminating parking spaces. What, which, what me, are a, we dealing a, with? As a resident, I, I, I use those parking spaces all the time when I go downtown. You have it in the last I, I do more, more. Than, than on street parking. I, to go to the thrift, if I'm dropping stuff off at the thrift store, if I'm going to a downtown meeting at the, at the uh, restaurant, or if I'm going to, to the pizza shop or wherever, I use them. I used to use them all the time. I so downtown. now, where, what do you use? I, I try to find some place or don't go downtown. It, it'll end up being like State College. I don't like to go to State College anymore because you can't get a parking place anywhere downtown most of the time. Well, uh, I, I said I that's it, my personal I think, we, I think we did. I, I wasn't there, but I know two members, one of our borough staff and one of our council member, did talk to some local business owners, and we did inform them of what may be occurring, and we did block them off to see what sort of feedback we would get from blocking those spaces off. And we've heard I, I have you heard much? Not much. And I, I, I've heard from three or four people. He's that. heard from three people, one business owner. I heard from one business owner. Too. Okay. They, didn't, they didn't care. Whatever. They what? They didn't care what you do with the parking. It didn't make any difference to them. No. So there you go. So again, we're going back to one complaint. Yeah. Three now, I, I've got three complaints. That's okay, two three. more than one. Three but three. I, three. That doesn't mean... That doesn't mean that we've done a survey. No, no, that I'm just, not saying that. I happen to run into a couple people who well, mentioned it. Well, one person it. killed. Sure. You're saying that was one complaint, so we're jumping to this. Now but but I do think, buddy, complaints. we are preparing, as Mary said, to present what is happening before anything is done. And that's why the temporary closures are in place. So, so we are planning to let people know before anything is permanent. Well, I think that's a good idea, and I think you ought to have that before you put those temporary barriers up there, too. Mm -hmm. Before you block you can, it off. Don and I talked to the business around that area. The State Burger, uh, the uh, Beer Lawn and Face Center. And, and, Pace Center. and they were all for it. They had no problem with it. Maybe it was the way it was They're, presented. It was presented pretty well. If, yeah. you know, if you want to join us, come around and, and you, know, you should have been there. But it went, the yeah, to sure. topic went very well in a situation with, with one that we were there for not that that wasn't our main reason for visiting with that business. But both both those conversations that we had with that business went well. Well, there should be some input from the public because the people will want to park there. Well, that's, that's why, that's why the decision was made that once the cruise was done, we'd leave those barriers in because they're already there. And then we'll kind of see what kind of response we get. And, and we've gotten very little. Very little. It's because nobody knows what's going on. Well, <laughs> they know the spaces are closed. Well, yeah. And they can call the borough. Well, let's put that out there. Tell them to call it the It should borough. be out there. I agree. I, it, it, if I was wondering why these things were blocked off, I'd call them the borough. I mean, that, you pull up there and there's no parking spaces and you pull someplace up and you say, oh, I want to. I would call the borough and say, what's going on with this? But so far, nobody has. Well, I, I called the borough when I when I realized I couldn't park downtown. And I found out. I talked to Ralph, and he told me the story. My neighbors across the street they asked me what's going on. I said, call the borough. I said, and I told them what I what I knew. And I said, you ought to call the borough. I said, I don't have any any input on. It. People aren't going to call us. It affects them directly. <coughs> That's what I mean. If it doesn't affect them directly, then they don't have. In an effort to stay on the agenda, can we just agree to post this on Facebook so we can ask for public feedback or send yeah. out a press release or something? Or because we have derailed this meeting yet again, and I would like to be home before 10. I do have a day job, and I'd like to get to it at a, a reasonable hour tomorrow. I have nothing else. So, and when you do the Facebook thing, say that there will be a public meeting in September. We just haven't set the date yet. Okay. 
So, anything else, buddy? Nothing. Okay, moving on to finance. Deb? Okay, uh, last council, uh, council approved the purchase of new body cameras by the police department. And I had had a question about where the actual dollar amount was. Uh, Lori indicated at our committee meeting that she's waiting on a final number from Chief Weaver and Sergeant Brower, but the funds are in the budget, so whatever the, the cost is, it's there. Uh, we discussed the budgeting process, touching on anticipated vehicle replacement and capital projects for 2022 and potential uses for the American Rescue Plan funds. I'll uh, be waiting basically till the end of third quarter when more of the numbers are in uh, at the end of September to begin pulling numbers uh, together for the 2022 budget. And the committee is in the process of updating language of the travel policy using GSA CONUS guidelines to determine reimbursement of per diem expenses incurred by elected and appointed officials traveling to meetings and conferences. We're still at the beginning of this stage of just updating all the language for that policy. And that's all I have. Any questions for uh, Deb? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to Parks and Rec. Melissa? I have no update for this meeting, but we will need to have a Parks meeting this Thursday. Um, the Annie from the YMCA would like to talk about the um, event she has planned, and then we have if possible, we can speak about the issue that Gary from the chamber brought up. So can you get, invite the, the interested parties to that meeting on Thursday? Yes. And I've already told Annie okay. she, is, she will be there. Okay. okay. Anything else for Parks and Rec? Um, nothing further. Oh, 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 oh. No, never mind. We can talk about that in our parks meeting. There's just an update on the bridge lighting situation. Um, that's it. Okay. Okay. Moving on to human resources then. John? Okay. Uh, we had a human resources uh, committee meeting on the uh, 14th. Um, in your packet, you will find a uh, document. Uh, uh, with a uh, discussion from our solicitor on recommendations uh, to uh, revising our um, harassment policy. This is for our employee handbook. Uh, she uh, provided a discussion of why she's recommending the changes and a revised policy. And uh, the committee is recommending uh, that we adopt this for our employee handbook. So I'm making a motion uh, to amend our employee handbook uh, with this revised harassment policy. Um, I'll second it. Prendergast, okay. Eden and Prendergast. To discussion? Yeah, I would, uh, for this, I'd like to know how many people actually read this. And understand it. Everybody read it. Mm -hmm. I have a problem with it because it's it doesn't talk about training. It, it talks all about uh, the harassment and what happens and what's implied, but it doesn't talk about training the staff that is overlooking or overseeing. And I think it needs some more work before this gets approved. Well, is that a shortcoming of our training policies? as opposed to a shortcoming of what would be in our employee handbook. I'm just saying, I've, I've been involved with these types of uh, programs uh, before, and there's always been some type of training included in it, well, in, the, in the policy. Oh, it is in the policy that you've, you've worked on? Okay. Yes. I'll, I'll okay. defer to your experience. My, my experience has been the training is a separate issue. The policy, the policy is what the employees should be doing. It, it should be, or, but the, the, yeah. what I'm saying is that the policy, the training is in, is in the policy because it's not a one and done. It continues year after year, continues, because new people come. The people get a little lazy, but the, the training still remains. Uh, I, I get your. I, 
if we, if, if I'm just giving you my point. Oh, I, and and I, 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 I see where Randy, you're coming from. I would agree with you if this wasn't like pretty black or white, where it's just like don't rape people and don't put up smutty calendars. Like, I don't think there's a lot of nuance in this. Um, there's no gray areas. It's not like what do you do if you're being like a more subtle form of sexual harassment. This is just pretty um, black and white. It, if I understand what Randy's thinking is that there should be a line in there that says annual training or something. Well, shit will be provided or where you're going. Do we go back to the solicitor and ask, do we have a hole in this policy if we don't mention training? The other thing is, is that in terms of training for these particular topics, the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission provides this to employers for free. We would just have to call and so it's not going to be an additional budget cost to get the training. And you could set it up however we best thought, but maybe your idea of what I'm hearing is that you may want to table this to get that question answered before we, we pass it. If so, I need someone to make a motion yeah. to table. This is a regular policy that you have to have training when you're hired or have it every year? Well, it's supervisors and, and employees. Yeah. So, yes, I, I agree it's an issue. Training is very important. I don't know if you necessarily have to hold up this policy to get that get that wording, but I think it definitely goes hand in hand. So you're, you're saying we could we could vote on the policy and go back to the solicitor and yes. ask for the ask for the solicitor's opinion. Do we have a hole yes. if we don't yeah, or have should, training? Yeah, or how should we address training? And, what any recommendations on that? But I I would say you're you're good to go and put this up for a vote. And then we can make a motion to request from the solicitor guidance. That would be a second yes. motion after that. Yes. 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 You good with that, Randy? I, I'm, not, yeah, I'm not opposed to what's in it. It's just what's not no. in it. No, you're raising a good, I'm, I'm saying that I don't have a firm answer that says you're not right in what you're proposing. So. And the solicitor's the person that can answer that. I'll call a question. Okay. Any other discussion? Seeing Did none. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? So moved. Make your motion, Randy. My motion. You want to make a motion to have the solicitor. Uh, uh, an opinion from the solicitor. Well, I, didn't, I didn't remember making a motion for this, so, so I'll, I'll go ahead and make that motion. Uh, okay, I'll make I'll make a motion that we uh, we verify this with the solicitor that we don't have a uh, uh, we have a that we don't have a problem by not specifying training in the in the handbook. I'll second it. Uh, just to keep, just so we can dot the I. Yeah. Cross the T's. Okay, so the motion I hear is that uh, to send a uh, request to the solicitor asking if we have a hole uh, in our employee policy by not mentioning um, training. Disregarding training, yeah. And if so, could she give us uh, some? Suggested language. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Suggested language. And then. Uh, so that was Eaton and Prendergast for yes. the taper. Yes. <laughs> okay. Discussion. Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, so moved. Okay, uh, we had a, um, a second item uh, brought before uh, Human Resources uh, uh, by uh, Ralph, uh, and he, Ralph has made a recommendation that we uh, we provide one day of vacation 
uh, for all of our employees that uh, are vaccinated or will become vaccinated as an incentive uh, for our employees uh, to become vaccinated and help us uh, avoid any uh, downtime being that we have a relatively uh, small amount of staff. That's very correct. We provide essential services 24-7. We have some people, or, you know, I, I, we, obviously we have no way of knowing exactly who has been vaccinated and who has not. We're just looking at an, an incentive to try to get maybe our numbers up near 90, 95 percent would be ideal. Uh, so that we don't have no loss of services. So do we need a motion to do that? Yeah, motion. motion. Give me a second. Okay. I'll make the motion to uh, provide one day of vacation for the uh, employees that are vaccinated or will be or choose to become vaccinated. Yes. Okay, I'll second that. Please. It's a one day of additional vacation. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> one day additional. <laughs> I'm stingy, Joanne. <laughs> Eden and Clayton. Discussion? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? So moved. Thank you very much. And that's the end of my report. Any questions for John? Seeing none, move on to safety. Randy? Now, we have not had a meeting uh, for safety uh, for uh, probably a month. We're still waiting on estimates from uh, pest control companies on the vulture issue uh, out of Missoula Park. So uh, until we get that information, I'm not sure. You know, have we heard anything from anybody? Or? We might have one, but not one. waiting on the other. I'll, we'll try to confirm or get an update on that. Okay. So that's that's all I have to report, and I guess uh, I won't get into the conversation we had earlier to start it all over again, but, you know, we are trying to do the best we can downtown for pedestrians and drivers. Uh, we did close some parking uh, after the uh, cruise uh, because those lots were already closed for that three-day weekend. Uh, we decided to leave those barriers in uh, to get a view from the residents. Uh, as to any issues that come about with that closing. So that'll help us with this meeting, public meeting that we'll be having in September then. Anything else for safety? Thank you, Randy. Um, Doug, water refuse and compost? Um, it really, what's on your sheet? Uh, there, there's been no committee meeting. Um, some of the minutes are in your packet. Uh, the uh, request for the joint meeting on August 2nd, uh, it was discussed by the authority and they're going to uh, draft a letter um, to the Spring Creek Water Commission uh, after the presentation on August 2nd. Um, and you see the June daily water withdrawal looked pretty reasonable except for two days when the pump was out uh, for one of the uh, towers. That's pretty much my report. Ralph, do you, do you have anything else? I think that covers it. Okay. Any questions for Doc? Seeing none. Mary, streets? Um, so there was the issue that came up of the um, angled street parking on South Allegheny Street there where it goes up the hill um, by um, after you go past a Verizon store and um, you know, we had talked about um, making the the drivable position uh, area of the road wider in several different ways we had talked about changing the angle we had talked about doing um, parallel parking rather than angled parking on one side of the street um, and it kind of at the time seemed sort of like a no-brainer but then people came out with the idea that that's going to actually speed up traffic as soon as the that that the exact thing that we're doing downtown at the diamond where we're where we're making people slow down and be careful and and be aware and watching of around their um, you know their environment while they're driving that's what those that narrowing of that road there 
um, has has done. So um, I wasn't at this meeting. So if if anybody who was at the, the this particular meeting um, wants to weigh in on this, I believe that um, the committee's feeling by the end of that meeting was that um, that it was best to to take no action at this time and to um, to allow the the, rem the road to remain narrow for the purpose of slowing down traffic on that hill. And I don't know if um, uh, if we need a motion to do nothing, or if so um, because we had a motion in the past. Oh, to we do already something. had a motion. So I we see. have to do a motion. We have to, to we have to do the the reverse motion. Yeah. Yes. So I. Uh, but she wasn't on council. Well, then I don't recall if it went to the streets committee and there that was the I mean that that was a direction because I don't think they ever it came out of a decision saying we're going to change the parking. Then they go to the streets as an item to. It. So maybe what we should do is take that back to the streets and have them come back with a final recommendation at the me next meeting. Okay. I thought that's what they, that's what they did. That was a final No, 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 no. Yeah, we're done deal. deal. We're not doing anything. Yeah. Okay, so we need a motion to do that. And she said she wasn't there. Someone else has to make that motion. Why? Because about a year ago, we went in and said that we were going to change it. And we told Public Works not to paint the lines. Uh, at that time because there was some construction to doing it and now the are point of making a decision to do that we come back with the concerns from the community saying that this is not going to be helpful are, we, are you sure that that's what that, that we said that we were going to change it or that we were just looking into it i would have to go look back in the minutes. same here I would have to go back and look yeah, at the I, I think we should just we, wait on We that. table it until okay. you get back yeah. and check what the minutes are. Yeah. Yeah, check I the agree. minutes and see what right. we've done. Because okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't see, I can't think of a time when we said we were actually going to change it. That's my recollection, but I, I may be wrong. What happens if we do nothing? Nothing, dog. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so then, then we don't have to so even worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, and then I guess the other um, question, if if we need an action, um, has to do with what we talked about in the um, in the session before um, before the chamber so that's started. Under, do we? That's under all business. No, so that's yeah. okay. So we don't need to do that. All right. Um, so there is um, a document. Um, from Pannonia and Associates in the packet um, about the stormwater runoff on Zion Road and the, the Cross Street. And because I was not at that meeting, Randy's going to talk to us. Oh, yeah? Oh, sorry. <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're, we're, oh, yeah, you can talk to us about it. That's, that's good. No, sorry. What we're talking about is a scope of work to uh, address the issues. Uh, at the Zion Road uh, and 550 stormwater issue that we're having in the Parkview Heights. So in order to do that, uh, Panini's uh, will charge us $14,664 that's proposed in the packet uh, to do this uh, scope of work uh, to complete uh, an idea or a plan of what we can do to correct the issue that we're having out there and that we've had been having for a number of years. Uh, this money is being funded through our highway with liquid fuels. Uh, and by the way, that is the same money that we're using to do the delineators and things downtown as well. So it's not coming out of general budget on any, any of these. Uh, so uh, basically, I, I'll make the motion that we go ahead and approve uh, Pinoni engineers to provide the scope of work needed uh, to formulate a plan to address the stormwater issue from Cyan Road, uh, State Route 550, to help with the, improve the conditions in Parkview Heights. I'll second that motion. Uh, Brad Brackville and Johnson uh, made a motion to approve the first part of the scope of work up to and including the stormwater investigation report, not to exceed 14664 dollars using highway aid funds for Pannoni engineers to review the stormwater issues on Zion Road near Parkwood. 
there's more to it, but that's just the first part of it. That's what the 14,600. Uh, discussion. Did we find out, uh, I know you checked into it, Ralph, uh, the ownership of that property? Yes, I, I know the owners okay. of the property. <clears throat> That's more than we knew. Yeah, I mean, when we started six months ago, we weren't sure, you know, if it had changed hands, but it has not. Okay. Other discussion? So this will be a study, the, the resulting design of the corrective solution will then be additional money. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also to determine liability. Who is liable? And that's really the most important thing, in my opinion, coming out of this. Okay. Okay. And no, they will, they will, Pannoni will be able to do that. They're going to do the research to find out, yes. That's part of the scope. That's okay. part of the problem we've been having because everybody that's involved with this said it's not my problem. Right, right. Okay. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, so moved. Okay, um, so I was at this meeting on the 15th, um, and Pannonian and Associates attended our meeting, and we discussed possible options for the diamond area. Um, there are kind of three ideas that are being floated around. Um, one is a circle, one is sort of a modified circle that requires fewer changes to the existing traffic flow, and then one would be more of a permanent um, version of the temporary solution that we are putting in place this fall. Um, so um, I believe the, the hope is to um, that the, well, that Someone from Pannoni will be here to talk to us about this um, during the August 2nd meeting, either in the work session before or as part of the meeting. Um, and um, and the, the plan will be to have a couple of public meetings on this, uh, maybe one during the day and one in the evening um, during, uh, in early September. Um, and. Um, Pannoni believes that we are well situated to to receive grant money to fund a large portion of the project. So I, I thought I earlier that so this uh, this project is this contingent on the uh, public meeting we're going to have with people to get their feedback, but it, but you did say this is what we're going to do, and. It's. It sounds like the you know the horses left the barn on this, and we're just having a public meeting to placate the. the no, citizens. I mean there there are at least three options on the table right now, oh, so um, and be something, but one of there will be something um, from from minimal um, changes that include you know just the bump outs to slow traffic through that area okay. to make the crosswalks shorter. Um, you know, some of the things will be like straightening the, the, the angled crosswalk t so that it's not any longer than it has to be. Um, and so, you know, that, so starting from that I very minimal um, plan up through and including the, the more involved uh, actual traffic cir circle plan. Okay. I, and, actually, I would say, Mayor, I think Mary and the committee has already met numerous times with Pannoni and has seen different variations. I think that Pannoni will come in to the next meeting to the full council and give it to everyone, mm -hmm. and then it'll be up to you, the full council, to decide whether you want it to, you know, take the next step and proceed with public uh, hearings mm -hmm. or just if maybe you, they'll come in and you don't like any of the ideas and you, the full council will say we're leaving it as it is. That might be the determination. Mm -hmm. The committee will have a recommendation, but the full council will determine the next all step. All right, all right. Mm -hmm. It sounded like the, this, this decisions decisions were made. That's all. Mm -hmm. That was far as came. The decisions made that we're going to make it safer, but what the final plan is, okay. it's unknown. Okay. Um, and then I wasn't sure if we needed uh, this. Um, this came up in the, the early session. Um, 
do we need a motion to write the letter in conjunction with Spring Township, or is that just something that will happen? Um, regarding have, the um, the Water Street Phoenix Avenue intersection. Well, actually, what I have, I had it done for old business, and it was actually two different motions. Okay. That, so, okay. do you want to do hold it off till then, or do you want to do it now? Doesn't matter. Why don't we do it now? Okay. 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 So the Don't first think. motion that I see, based on what uh, Tom Zilla said, is to, a motion to uh, request that Donald Ralph meet with uh, Mr. Daniker at Spring Township uh, to uh, hopefully create a joint letter of interest for the Phoenix Avenue project. Would okay. I? I'll make that motion. Okay. Who's going to second it? I'll second it. And <coughs> angered. Uh, discussion. Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? So moved. The second one is uh, someone needs to make a motion of what they would like to see happen with the mill race, whether that's complete removal uh, or putting the culvert pipe in or leaving it as it is. What kind of motion do you want? Um, and based on what uh, Mr. Zilla's comments were, cause, so that we can send that to the TIP program. Well, can I, can I make a motion that we actually study that option, or we that we actually study what our options are since we now have an additional year with the mill race? And maybe what we do is uh, maybe use the sustainability students to tell us how much how much water we might mm -hmm. have in the mill race and what the probability is of in a flood event, what kind of water level we're dealing with, because being that we control the upstream and the downstream of that, we might be liable for what happens in that mill race. And the other question is, I would also like to know what's underneath the, uh, the brick at Talleyrand Park, because if we're going to preserve that mill race, we might have to someday preserve that deck that that mill race yeah. runs underneath. So, so, but you know, we try to keep vehicles off of. I yeah. think there's a couple yeah. places I've where. I've seen vehicles on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, what's on? Yeah. What, what the supports the concrete? The deteriorating. And how thick is the concrete? Yeah, I don't remember. Really Concrete's thick, but I you know, think it's supported by just poles. Yeah. Like uh, telephone uh, poles. Knowing somebody, telephone poles. That's what they no, look like. No, oh. Knowing someone Here. who's gone down there, it is basically telephone poles. I think we should look into that because that yeah. could be. I'm sure telephone poles don't last forever. Right. And so we, it, there might be some other things other just other than just the ambiance of water in the mill race that we might want to think about when we make this decision. Do you want to make a motion to do that? Yes. I'll, I'll make a motion that we, uh, that we, we, we study the mill race in its entirety relative to the long-term our long long term aspects and hopefully use the sustainability students. Okay, that's Eden who's seconding the motion. Second Prendergast. Any discussion? Hmm. Let's be off the hook for a while. <laughs> that's, why I, that's why I did I, it for I, you, Michael. <laughs> I'm not sure whether I'm for filling it in or not. The discussion may be, will that hinder our um, ability to perhaps transfer the funds? Even though we're extended by one year, uh, it sounded to me like uh, Tom wanted an answer, I guess, just uh, by both borough and the township before well, I'm, yeah. I'm just trying to think. I, I don't want it to. If, I don't want to miss the opportunity if funds can be transferred. I think. I think what he was trying to say is pursue the joint partnership okay. over on Phoenix and 150 with Spring before September, 
and keep this separate. Yes. Keep this funding, this issue separate. Yes. Don't try to mix them together. Okay. What That's what I understood That's as well. Understood. Okay. <laughs> Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of John's motion to do a full millway study, please say aye. 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 All opposed? So moved. Um, anything else? Just know. two quick items. Uh, uh, the Borough Street Paving Project is complete. It was completed last Friday. Our contractor finished up. Uh, our work, uh, West Curtain Street, is on the paving. It's to be paved sometime the first around the beginning of August, and it's going to be done by Columbia Gas or their contractor. So they will be doing that end. That's, That's great, great. Great news. Yes. Thank Matt Holman. I think he helped. Me yes, it. we will. And I will say that the paving that I've seen was well done. Yeah. yeah. It's quick. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I saw those guys digging up on uh, Gator Street there one day and they put a new gas line in or whatever they were yeah. doing. And I thought, gee, I didn't know they were doing this. And next, <laughs> next day it's paved all right. Like, that was quick. Mm -hmm. They're good. It's fast. The other one was West Curtain Street. Just wanted to let everyone know. Okay. Okay. okay then I, we'll move on. I have on. one thing for streets. Huh? I have one thing for streets. Okay. I'd like us to, at our meeting Thursday, discuss possibility of making Home Street up to Valentine Street, is that by the county building, making that one way up the hill. Say again, uh, what, what was the street? Home Street to Valentine Street. Uh, what, what I've noticed out there is that in Spring Township, if you go down past the hot dog house, you cannot make a left turn uh, there going into Bush Edition. You have to make a right and the delineators are in place, and that's mm -hmm. what it shows. So people coming down are now being forced to go to the red light. Um, what this would do is do the same thing for county. They would have to go to the red light. That red light then would control the traffic coming into town, just like it does now, but the county folks won't be able to come down that and make that right turn when that light's not working. And that's a hard place to pull out of anyway. Uh, You're talking about going down Home Street. Yeah, you know, just having yeah, one right. way in. So this way, I think it eases up some pressure at the Phoenix Avenue area, while other streets still can work off their stop signs. You know, it'd be the same thing. It's almost as good as my uh, my two red light suggestion, but I'll stick. <laughs> I'll get one in, in the play. I, I think like it'll help red. for a, for a short term or maybe even long term. I mean, that that light's there, and that might have to. You know, we may have to get something set up with our Water Street light to that light out there, and so they get all sunk together a little bit. Uh, but I think it would be worth looking into, at least talking about it at our meeting. Okay. Well, I think that's a good idea. But we talked years ago about that, too. The biggest thing was traffic backing up coming into Buffalo from State College. And, and the problem was, and I know we talked to the dog or somebody there about trying to get that light fixed. Because on Bush Edition, that light on demand light, it's almost what it is. You might have one car come out and you got 30 cars backed up the hill, mm -hmm. and they don't let those people sit there long enough to clear the traffic out. Mm -hmm. So we, if you're going to do that, I think we need to talk about timing there somehow. Depend on clear that out. Yeah. You know, yeah. People coming in from State College. Yeah. You have multiple ways to get into Belfort yeah. now than, than we've had most, a number of years most ago. Most the ones that don't live here don't know those ways. <laughs> Thank God. Yes. Yes. I, I, I sort of, I sort of like where you're going, Randy. I mean, I, I like people coming into Belfont by coming in off of the bypass and coming up past uh, the high school. That's much better than mm -hmm. trying to come down Benner Pike. Yeah, that's a lot of turns and turns in that route. Yeah. Plus stopping on a hill. Yeah. yeah. Would that push traffic the out? outbound traffic into a residential neighborhood to get over to the where the red light is. Valentine Street yeah, it runs down and you know, runs in through residence and then back mm -hmm. down to the light. They'll come across Blanchard from ninety nine instead of going down the the mm -hmm. So it'll put more pressure on Blanchard Street. Good coming down to Bishop. Okay. 
Well, no, they don't go down to Bishop. They make a left on Crawford and, and come down and, by your house. and run the stop I'm sign sure. by my house and then go down, <laughs> go down the hill. Well, that's the intent. Yeah. Well, yeah. Next, yeah. we won't allow them to get off on <laughs> well, off topic. That's, that's yeah. another. That's another story. <laughs> Sounds like another traffic study. <laughs> yeah, really. Okay. Anything else for streets? Okay. Then moving on to energy and environment. Okay. We did not have a meeting since the last uh, borough meeting. Uh, well, we do have one coming up on Wednesday. Uh, and that's all. That's. Pretty much all I have except uh, this uh, Saul Smart webinar overview for Ms. Cleeton and uh, Ms. Thompson. Yeah. Do you all want to say what you heard? I'm going to defer to Ms. Thompson. She's the one who had comments. And the, she asked a question and had a comment during the webinar. Oh, my gosh. I did. Yes, did. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I knew you were there. That's what you get for opening your mouth. <laughs> Feel free to uh, remind me of what my question was. I that that meeting feels or that webinar feels so long ago now. Um, yeah, so I attended attended virtually just a webinar last week, um, and uh, and Deb can can help out here. Um, it was just basic informative kind of uh, webinar on you know how to attract solar investment, as the title suggests. Um, my recollection from the webinar, I took some notes, not a ton, was just kind of going through um, why to attract uh, solar investment into the community, the benefits of that, kind of just the fact that long term that's going to be the way we're headed. Um, and then they did dive into a little bit about how to um, address solar um, solar energy in ordinances so of course i kind of perked up and and listened to that and they talked a bit about really trying to um create um or get rid of barriers that um, make it difficult in terms of zoning ordinances to have um, solar energy uh, development in the community um, I have my own personal biases, pros and cons for solar investment. Um, one thing that I did appreciate that they mentioned in the webinar was that um, solar farms, uh, a lot of communities require that they provide uh, pollinator friendly ordinances for their solar farms, which I found really fascinating because um my own personal kind of issues with solar farms is that they you're actually clear cutting the environment to put in the farm so it's like this two-sided environmentalist kind of thing um i personally as an outdoor adventurist am not in favor of clear cutting the environment to put in solar development so at least this is some sort of meshing of the two where you create an ordinance and require pollinator ground cover um, that also deals with the impervious versus pervious issue. Um, it was informative. I did reach out to PML because usually when you attend these webinars, they give you the handouts and the recording, which are always helpful to reference when you go back. And we didn't get that. And I, and I was looking for that in preparation for tonight. Um, so I emailed them. I, I don't believe. Well, I went to the Soul Cards Box for website. Yeah can access <coughs> under their criteria thing you can get the best practices in solar planning and zoning webinar you can download the webinar itself or you okay. can download the slides okay. excuse me download the slides um, my we're sort of on the same page my gut reaction was that this was an industry sales pitch yeah. for companies that want to do that want to encourage solar development which is a great idea, but they are doing it on a mega level. Uh, they were talking about uh, solar arrays that generate 200 megawatts needing 1,500 to 2,000 acres, which you know kind of puts it outside our realm. Uh, and community community scale solar energy systems of 20 acres or less. 
uh, when they talked about the pollinator garden, I wondered which calendar they got that picture out of. Because yeah, there's, that's there's no such animal as maintenance-free landscaping. Yeah. Um, and looking at the, the solar arrays that are already in Venner and College Township, up by the, uh, the hospital over by UAJA and by the correctional facility, I did go out and look at what those arrays look like and what the, the ground maintenance is underneath because you have to maintain the vegetation. Now two of those are mowed. The one by the hospital sadly looks like it's been sprayed because it's on such a steep hillside you couldn't possibly mow it. And that means it's all running down into Spring Creek. Uh, the contradiction here, of course, is that you're putting in a solar array to generate electricity, but you're more than likely mowing them with a gas-powered riding mower. Um, anyway, the webinar was, was interesting. They kind of downplayed, um, to make it easier for, for big investment in, in solar, they were kind of pushing the elimination of building heights for new construction so that if you've got a building that's designed to be within your parameters and they want to put a solar array on top that sticks up a little bit to you know watch it there that you're not changing your your building height requirements to accommodate um, what they're they're pushing is to let that go to increase your building heights to accommodate solar. They downplayed the need for uh, glare studies unless the array is near an airport. Uh, like I said, it's very, it's industry centric, but it's worth downloading and taking a look at least the slides. It might be interesting just to, why, to see those slides and compare mm -hmm. it to the solar report that Wilson Engineering did for us because that report gives us four or five different options mm -hmm. of what the borough could do for solar energy. One of them is doing this industrial kind of thing. They, I don't remember which one of them, but he said one of them financially does not make a whole lot of sense right. for me. And from what you just said, I kind of think that this is what this Soul Smart thing is. Right. I think it's the scale of what this community can do other than rooftop installations is really kind of limited. Mm -hmm. I think there were uh, Mike, you shared something a couple of weeks ago that had some uh, examples of ground installations in the borough. One is over by the wastewater treatment plant, one is out by Governor's Park, and the other one is up uh, by high, by the bingo hall, which would be the largest one. That still is going to be less than 10 acres. Mm -hmm. you know, so we're looking at a much smaller scale. Mm -hmm. There's also the school district. That's why we yeah. have to look at, uh, if you're going to have ground raise, we need to revise along with what Gina mm -hmm. said uh, to re uh, change the amount of space for larger properties to allow greater than 1,000 square feet because mm -hmm. that is 10 feet by 100 feet and that would not even allow the school right. district to put any uh, solar energy for their Right, needs. and I think you need to look at the out you know, whatever the size of the array, the output that you're going to generate, is it really going to be beneficial mm -hmm. for the cost of the installation and taking up that kind of ground space? And that's what this report with Wilson Engineering yeah. did. Um, actually, I was thinking if I can download the slideshow and just get that to everybody. Sure. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and during the the webinar, they mentioned uh, the National Renewal Energy Lab is having a webinar tomorrow at noon, but I've not been able to find that that link. Mm -hmm. N R L. N R N R E L. Yeah. Uh, they I'll, do. I'll, I'll they, get that for you. They do have a website, but I could not find anything there about tomorrow's oh. webinar. Oh, okay. Anyway, it was interesting, but it was definitely industry-centric. I agree, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Anything else from that webinar? Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to special committee reports. 
Yes. I think Randy and I have been, whether he knows it or not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, yeah, yeah. Um, the, 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 the uh, Valley Joint Plan uh, had a meeting uh, Thursday, July 15th. Uh, the, the, the most important part for me was, uh, and I'm going to pass it along to the uh, borough authority, uh, Liz Lose, uh, county planner, assistant, I think she's assistant county director mm -hmm. planner. She um, informed <coughs> us that there's, uh, and I, I, this is million with an M, $31 million is being awarded to Center County. Uh, for this uh, American Rescue Plan money. And she was asking anybody in attendance if their boroughs or townships had projects that would qualify for the some of the allotment of this money. And the allotment is going to be vetted by the county commissioners, as I understand it. And immediately came to mind our water authority has several projects that I think would qualify uh, and she asked that back me up on this that we make those requests as soon as possible so I'd like to maybe Ralph if you touch bases with Liz sure. uh, but, but I can give you the website if you want me to or I can email it to you uh, it's yeah. American Rescue Plan at centercountypa.gov okay. American Rescue Plan all one word Written out. At centercountypa.gov. Okay. And if you want, I can even mail that to you if, if you don't have Sure, sure. Okay. Um, so some things came to mind. Uh, the water tower, our reservoir on uh, Reservoir Hill, the new roof that we need there for that, uh, the resurrection or the reconstruction of the water tower behind Faith Church. Uh, and I don't know if our Bink Spring cover project would uh, qualify for some of that money or not, but uh, that's a lot of money. So if there's anything else I can, that's, that was the gist of it for me at the meeting. Randy might have other information. I, actually, I, didn't, I didn't bring my notes with that, Matthew, and I didn't. Uh, Liz did get a, uh, 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 an appointment. I think she's a... Assistant, assistant county assistant director, yeah, assistant yeah. director. And there's a new gentleman that's taking her place, and I don't have his name with me. Uh, Peter. Pete, yeah, it was Peter something. But anyway, uh, oh, other than that, what, other than what Doug reported, it was uh, you know discussion about highways, things like that, and just just normal business uh, with with the group. So okay. that completes my report. Any other special committee reports? Thank you, Doug. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're moving on to uh, old business. Uh, we, we did receive two proposals. Unfortunately, they were received today in regard to the facilitator at groups who are looking at getting facilitating facilitator services for an upcoming retreat with council as well as a, a meeting, a stakeholder type meeting with for the short term rental ordinance uh, issue. And anyway, so I know you haven't had a chance to look over the two proposals. I wouldn't expect that. Uh, I think we're just talking informally with Joey, and we thought it would be best to forward those to one of the committees and then come back with a recommendation. At the August 2nd meeting. So I'd like to refer that to finance that's in Dahl's money. Okay. <clears throat> that is the only old business item that we have on the agenda. <coughs> so we can move on to new business. And I think that's your... Well, we had a call from Fish and Boat. They have uh, been catching some people fishing in the uh, Spring Creek right between the High Street Bridge and the waterfalls and up in that area. So they asked uh, if we would uh, place some additional no fishing signs. They brought some That's over to us and years uh, our staff will uh, post those on the walls down there and try to prohibit people from fishing in that area. 
There have been signs down there. Don't, don't no, have, we have around. a couple, but they, according to Fish and Boat, we didn't have enough, Mike. They wanted to see more. Okay. So they're going to put them on the walls. So they're going to have to get the into wall. the stream. Our staff is going to have to get into the stream to put the signs up. <laughs> uh, on a hot day, that will probably feel pretty good. <laughs> yeah. They're not in violation of our sign ordinance, are they? <laughs> 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 we have to approve these signs. Well, we're going to have to take a look and see what color is going to work best with the landscape. Any other new business? There was a letter from Scott Rote inviting council to their annual EMS meeting on Monday, August 30th. Okay, since okay. we have a, a two meetings, or at least the August 2nd meeting. Mm -hmm. But yes, he's having his annual meeting, up-to-date uh, meeting that he's been having the last several years. Anything else? Okay, and is there any public comment from any? Please state your name, where you live. Where you I'm Sean, 420 East Logan Street, second floor. Um, I've never addressed the council before, but uh, Randy, I, Randy, you and I have communicated back and forth uh, on the next door website about what I'm here to talk about. Um, I just want to bring up three addresses uh, of concern, uh, one of which is 341 East Bishop, 310 Blanchard, and 426 East Logan. Um, these three residences, uh, the people there do not control their animals. Uh, mainly barking dogs, 5 o'clock in the morning, 5.30 in the morning, all hours of the day, uh, sometimes up to midnight, 1 in the morning. Um, I spoke, I've, I've spoken with Mr. Haupt, the former animal control officer, several times before he retired. I spoke with one animal control officer that I believe is no longer with the borough. Um, nothing's really being done. Um, I've spoken with police. All they say, call it in, is all they ever say. I've done that. These particular addresses, it just continues. Um, 341 Bishop Street, or 341 East Bishop, uh, again, even over the weekend, Saturday morning, 5.30, 5.45 in the morning, and I can hear it at my house. People that live on Burnside behind me hear it. Uh, 310 Blanchard, of folks that live at the old Bishop Street School Apartments, they know about that particular house. They have six dogs. I've spoken with the male resident that lives there before about, about the dogs being out late, especially when I was working early mornings. I was getting up at 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning to go to work. His response to me was, go get an effing day job. Um, 426 East Logan, they're my next door neighbors. Um, I've spoken with them several times in the last five years that I've lived here. Um, they pretty much blow me off. I've asked them to put the dog in the house. They have a little yellow dog that never shuts up. It barks at everything. Um, they put the dog in the house for about 10, 15 minutes. They let it back out again. Um, even on Sunday, even as, you know, as recently as yesterday, I was home all day. Uh, the dog was out from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. barking all day. I don't even know if anybody was home. I never went over there to look. Um, again, it's been several years. It's ongoing. Now it's more residences. Um, people on Bishop Street I've talked to about 341 East Bishop, they just kind of put their heads down, yeah, we know about it, and they kind of put up with it. And same thing with the other two addresses, people just put up with it. Um, I'm told the 310 Blanchard Street address is a years-long problem um, where the folks that live there just, they do whatever they want and people put up with it. I want to be able to live in my house. I want to be able, I understand where, you know, during the day people are going to do their thing and people have to live. But I do want to bring attention to Borough Ordinance Chapter 372-11, which regards the noisy animals. Reading that, that ordinance, and knowing what's going on with these homes, they're clearly violating the ordinance. Um, and Chapter 193-6 talks about the fines and enforcement. To my knowledge, none of that's been done. I don't know if it has or not, but to my knowledge, it has not. 
I'm just asking the council, especially those who represent my ward, if we can ask animal control to, to do something about it, ask the police to do something about it. Randy, you told me come to a council meeting. Here I am. Um, uh, I will uh, talk yeah, to Mr. the Wilson. chief, and uh, we've talked before yeah, as well. We have, yeah. uh, Ralph, I'll, I believe we have too. I I'll talk to the and chief, Joanne, I believe and we have too. Uh, I know that uh, we have to work on priority stuff. Sure. But, you know, everything's a priority. If it's an ordinance, that's the way I see it. The police, unfortunately, don't quite see it sure. that way, and we've had discussions about that. But I'll bring it up. I have a note here to talk to the chief about it, and I'll also talk to the sergeant about it as well. Thank you. On, on the report we get from the police department, there's a list, and on that list is dark barking dogs. And mm -hmm. when I look at that, mm -hmm. each month it says zero. Mm -hmm. So I don't know who's taking the calls and how they're getting passed on, you know, that's, to, to that's whoever. That's a question I have too. So, right. you know, it's, it just seems to stop right there. Yeah, well, uh, my question is why? <laughs> I had an incident here a couple of months ago where a neighbor left a dog out. He, well, he left them in, but he screen open, so I barked till midnight or whatever. And I did call the police. They this come is up. Three, four, one East Bishop. No, location. no, I live up in Curtin Street. Yeah. But anyway, the uh, police did come up a little bit later, and uh, I, well, the guy who lived there apparently just was gone from the day or whatever. I don't know. But anyway, I gave him the own, name of the owners of the house because it, it was a renter. And he was going down the street to talk to them, see what they could do. And apparently, the guy must have come back. But the officer told me, he said, that's one of the most complaints they get is barking dogs. He said, they get them every week, almost every day, someplace. Yeah, well, so it needs to be enforced, I think. Somebody needs to get fined over it to get their attention. I do want to say that I, I appreciate the fact that people do have animals. My next door neighbors, for example, the dog in question, they have rescued it. They say the dog was previously abused. I respect the fact and I'm very happy that they rescued an animal that needed a home. However, there is called training your dog. And when they just let it bark and it, but nobody, they just kind of, people just sweep it under the rug. Um, but again, it's not that I'm, I don't like dogs because I've raised dogs and cats all my life. So it, you know, it's nothing to do with me hating animals. I love animals, but it's just a point where it's, you know, kind of disturbing the peace, I guess, to put it blunt, uh, to put it mildly, I guess. Well, thanks for coming in and sharing that with us once again, and we'll we'll look into it once again. All right, and hopefully we'll get some results. Thank thanks. you. Keep, keep me posted. Thanks, Randy. I will. Uh, yeah, the same with me. I'd like to know how it's going. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any any other public comments? Yes? Okay. Okay, if there's no other comments. Uh, to I'll second that. Okay, so uh, Brackville and Prendergast at 927.